Hey guys and girls, it's Birchie here, just giving you guys a bit of a recap and a walk down at memory lane. The last 12 months have been extremely fun and interesting out there. When we look at all the craziness out there in the world, you've got to question a lot of the information that's coming to you and look at what's facts and what's not. In the last 12 months, we've seen interest rates go up massively. I've got a few little articles, I'm kind of laughs when I get the article. It's more of an insult to everyone's intelligence to have this shit for it now. There. So, Sydney Morning Herald, the stench of auction failure as property prices face further falls. Uh, this one here, news.com. Sign interest rate hikes could see house prices nosedive. This one here, Philip Lowe is used to being the bad news guy for first home buyers as skyrocketing multi mortgage payments cripple so many household budgets. ABC News, Australia records the biggest, largest drop in house and unit days within one year. Uh, the data show. Here's another one from the 90s. Australians locked out a property market sh- plan, plan now. This one here, all these call for a ban on foreigners buying investment property. News.com, more bad news news for renters as landlords indicate more rent rises. Mortgage prisoners trapped by negative equity and renting out their homes. Everybody's renting out their homes apparently, right? Everyone's renting out their properties. That's why there's no fucking rentals out there, right? Come on, who's writing this stuff? Another common news here, home prices rise, but consumers think it's a bad time to buy a house. ASX ends higher on Fed Paul's hopes as it happened. This is on the 13th of June. This one was from November 2023. Nervous property buyers wonder how far will property prices fall? The 4th of June 2023, a quarter of Australia's property investments held by 1% of taxpayers' data reveals. Uh, Here's another shit news. More Australian homeowners offloading properties at a loss as interest rate rises take toll, new data shows. Here is an article, I think it's from The Australian, maybe, it says Australia's rental affordability drops to its worst levels in nearly a decade. And this one here is from the 16th of January 2023 from the ABC Common News. Has Australia's housing boom hit the end of the road, but could the economy be taken down with it. So they're saying now that it's the economy that's got to go down because of the house market. Anyway, go figure. So looking at the rental market at the moment, right? Um, the reason why I'm the happiest motherfucker that you'll find is that rents are just going through the roof, right? If you've got uh, if you've got 10 properties and they go up 100 bucks a week, there's a thousand bucks a week. If you've got 100 properties, there's 10 grand a week, there's a half a million dollars a year, right? If you've got 200 properties, there's a million dollars a year and extra rental income coming through. So you've got more people being forced into the lower end of the market. So there's more activity happening there, less stock in the market. Plus, you're not seeing any returns on your shares. You're seeing all these different financial markets fall into a really bad position. And you're seeing convergence of rents going up. I've got literally thousands of properties were bought the last year, which have had 10% plus yields in capital cities around Australia. So there is a lot of activity happening out there which isn't being reported. I don't know why. Some of the sort of numbers here, I'm just looking at around this baby here, um, $140,000 for a three bedroom house or land, um, nothing for sale under 200,000 in this market. Uh, rental figure on it is $310 per week. So 310, that's about a 12% yield on a house or land in Australia. Sydney, two bedroom unit, $290,000 uh, rent, was getting about 270, 280 per week when we bought it. There's nothing under $400 per week in this market. So it's caught up instantly a hundred bucks a week straight away from buying the thing. One of the largest retail cities in Australia. Uh, 235,000 for a two bedroom unit. Uh, comparable sales on over $300,000 there. Rent 420 bucks per week. Here's one that we just picked up uh, two weeks ago. Uh, $180,000 for a two bedroom villa. Um, we cannot buy for under $240,000 now. I've got another one here, $200,000 which has just settled a week ago. The seller went through, we paid 200 grand for it. This investor revaded for $269,800. Here's another one, just random. 320,000 in Parramatta in Sydney, right? Some people go, oh, these properties you talked about, there must be some dog shit location, whatever the case may be. They're not, they're in capital cities, right? Uh, 160 grand, rent to $700 per week. <laughs> Previous sales, 560 grand in the same complex go back in the last decade. Here we are with another one for 168 grand, uh, rent for $320 per week. I was gonna leave it there. Uh, this is a few deals that we're working on. 
You can buy properties under 200 grand still. You can buy properties with 10% yield still. You can still build large property portfolios in the current market. I've been doing the investor now for 14 years and I've seen more first time investors build double digit property portfolios than ever before in the last 12 months. But I had seen massive amounts just slightly just keep increasing, right? Uh, you know, where will the interest rates be in the future? Everyone's too focused on little things. They're not realizing interest rates. Are, I, I'm seeing interest rates go up. Yes, I'm paying uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars extra interest per year, but that's the opportunity for me to be able to push my cash flow up. And I know that six months, 12 months, 24 months down the track, interest rates turn around. Happy days for me. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Carolyn, for putting that together. I just want to acknowledge uh, the marketing team tonight. So, Nadia, uh, Carolyn, um, Paul Linda, she's not in marketing, but she's the business manager for Fee Invested. And I'm missing someone. Oh, Bridget. We're putting uh, tonight together and arranging everything. I didn't have to do anything. I just said, come up and speak. So uh, uh, let's give a round of applause to the girls. So whenever you see Nathan do a Facebook Live or a, a webinar, Carolyn over here is the, is the one behind the camera. Or the podcast. Or the podcast. Yeah, she's the one that arranges all that, all the notes, all the articles for Nathan. So well done, Carolyn. Thanks for everyone for coming. Um, I was thinking beforehand, like, we've got such a nice crowd here tonight. There's so many people in the rooms, put, rooms packed. Um, and it was, it was actually 14 years ago where um, you know, we had our first day of the financial year party. And you know, Chris may have been there around the second one. And there's a few people in the room that have you know, done really, really cool with their, their results and their portfolio. And um, yeah, this room obviously is a safe space for everyone here. I encourage everyone to network in between breaks and stuff like that. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge in the room and a lot of people that have got really, really cool results here. So um, yeah, just on that note. Um, and thank you, Wayne, for doing the MC. And you said that everyone did stuff for you that just walk up. I literally just walked up and had a chat out. So thanks everyone. Chris, over to you. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah. Okay, we were talking about rental uh, increases tonight. We are talking about legislation that's coming your way. Uh, what's happened in Queensland will happen in New South Wales. It's just a matter of time. And how that's going to affect you with your properties going forward. Um, over the past 10 months, I guess, we have been writing rent reviews. We have been increasing values according to the current market. Uh, at Link, across all entities, we've uh, managed about 1,500 plus rent reviews. Okay, so every one of your properties has been affected. That's good. Um, average rental increase has been just over $42. So we need to extrapolate that out for a year. You get a good return back on the same investment, right? Yes, you are paying more in your interest rates, but interest rates aren't going to stay up that long. They're going to come down again. So once they come back into reasonable levels, that cash flow is still going to be there. So that's a good thing. Um, for example, the biggest one that we had was on an existing uh, property with a, another property um, management company had a rent out of two hundred and twenty dollars a week. Uh, we did a market appraisal on it. We saw that the rent uh, was definitely higher than that. Uh, we took the management on. Uh, we get an increase of one hundred and fifty dollars a week. Start with the value. So if you do have properties out there with other agents, make sure they're working for you because they want to keep their tenants happy. Okay, that means your cash flow is going to be a bit in the right. We're realistic in what we do. Uh, we take into account the condition of the properties, um, but you've got to get money back on the investment. And that's what Nathan's all about, that's what the investor's all about, that's what Clint's all about. If you're settling for leads, you're um, disadvantaged. Uh, I guess, just back on what Chris was saying there as well, I mean, once we're securing properties, a lot of people come to me and say, um, Nathan, you've told me that the rent's going to be 300 bucks a week, but it's only 250 bucks a week. Like, that's a bit of a different while would they be renting it? So I would always look at them like, the agents don't just rent, they don't sell things below market value, but they're actually renting them below market value as well. Um, so if we look through, on average, let's say we onboard the property that we pick up for someone, what would be the average that you'd say about 40 bucks a week or something, so that? Yeah. 
50 and 60 in most areas of the world. And how many, what percentage of properties would need a rent increase when we on board it? Uh, probably all of them. So we can govern by existing leases and things. Okay, cool. It's great. It's great to be alive. Everyone's scared. Everyone's scared. Interest rates are going up and all that sort of stuff, which you know, it is concerning, obviously. Naturally, the interest rates you know, are affecting everyone. So I was talking about it jokingly, but you know, if we buy a property for 200 grand or 300 grand or 150K, and it's renting for 200 bucks, 300 bucks a week, imagine being a homeowner, which you know, most of us have mortgages that could be quite expensive, and I know I'm pretty big as well. Um, but imagine being the average homeowner that's out there that has to pay the mortgage, like the $1 million mortgage. Without any investment properties, you have to pay for that extra increase in the interest yourself. You don't have the opportunity to have a half dozen tenants or 20 tenants putting up all the rents to help cover that shortfall, which um, I think on the other side of this, like Chris is saying, as interest rates start coming back, we're going to see that's, that's what you can retire on. So it's part of the cycle. So all those figures that I just talked about equate to about a 13% increase in rents year on year in New South Wales and Queensland. Uh, Western Australia, and we've got our new licensee in the audience tonight, so I've been up in uh, Perth. Maybe we will get uh, Sharon. Welcome, Sharon. Sharon, you will be set up. So, a lot of people don't realise I'm just literally in Perth CBD. We're set up our office there and we're managing properties all on the, on the west coast, from top to bottom of the west coast. And uh, Sharon's leading the team over there. And uh, what are some of the, I sent you a text message today of someone with a property. And I said, we'll talk about it later, but we'll talk about it now. <laughs> a little meeting here, folks. 310 bucks a week. That needs to go to 410 to 420 per week. So it's on the text message I sent it to you today. Like, I don't see most of those rents. Who's got a property west of Australia? There we go, Shane. Go need all those people up. <laughs> Everything over there is set up like 20 to 30 percent. Yes. And the other good thing about WA is, unlike Queensland and I think New South Wales, who can only do rent increases once a year, in WA we can still do them twice a year. So every six months, even if a tenant's on a 12-month lease, we, it's usually got a six-month rent review clause. Yeah. Built into the lease, so we can increase the rent every six months at the moment. Yeah, I'll touch on that later, Sharon. Um, so Thanks, Sharon. Yeah. Sorry to bring Sharon to us. Sort of, uh, people, everyone's asking where the link was trail. I can see it. I was just chat. <laughs> so. so in Western Australia, the figures are about 16.9% across the board here on here for a pretty big uh, increase in that. So, we've got the properties there. Yeah, it's a big growth market for us. Um, a fun fact as well is CPI, right? They used to have like in their CPI when they got caught up by certain percentages, you like to do what's up by certain percent. But when you look at CPI, they used to class like a steak, and now they put like you know mid speed in there. Now they do beyond meat, so it's funny how they change things on there. But in CPI. Those figures that they shared, they used to be for mortgages, but now it's actually for rents. So it's going to be fun to see the fact of the rent rising at those levels and how that will correlate to the CPI or the CPI. Sure. Um, we just want to touch on now some of the legislative changes that are going to be coming through. Um, New South Wales, a little bit behind the, the eight wall. Uh, they've got a discussion paper out at the moment uh, with submissions due by the middle August on a variety of things. They're talking about uh, grounds for just removing tenants um, without any uh, reason. I guess they don't want to do that anymore. Okay. Uh, the, so the 90 day no cause notice is going to go. When they put it out for a discussion paper, that's generally the outcome that they want. They'll give people a chance to put submissions in, but that's what it's going to be like. Uh, secondly, in New South Wales, they would allow pets in the property that the, the, the um, tenant wishes to have. Okay, so Australia is still a little bit up in the air on that one. They have a bit of uh, a jurisdiction over what goes into a unit. Pony, uh, a dash in a single unit, uh, so they can, they can uh, dictate what you have and can't do. So we are covered a little bit in 
that respect. Uh, now Queensland have gone to uh, greater lengths. They've got a home, um, what do you call it, Jane? Sorry? The minimum housing? The minimum housing standards in Queensland, right? So you have to have a draft free property. So anything that's got draft areas around the windows has to be fixed. Okay. Uh, anything that has to have uh, security doors and windows has to be looked at. Uh, the oven has to work. There has to be at least two elements that have to work in the oven. Uh, the windows have to have locks on them. Unless you're on the ground floor, you can do has to have locks. Anything above has got to have child safety devices and things like that. So as we move to that type of direction in New South Wales, there's going to be cost involved for it. That's compliance costs. Um, if your property is ahead of the market and you can demonstrate that these things are in your property, quality of your property is going to be higher, the demand for your property is going to be greater. And so don't leave it till the last time, because all these things have a time reader. Don't leave it till the last thing. Look at getting these things done prior. Okay. Um, that comes back then to our repairs. Everything that we refurbish has a 21% gain against the market price. So if we've got a new bathroom or a kitchen, we put in ACs, we do carpet, we do paint. These are the types of properties that tenants now have that higher expectation of moving into. So if you're a concerned owner and you want longevity in the tenants, start looking at things that are going to make them happy to stay. In New Zealand in 2016, they brought in the same standards that Queensland had. Uh, yes, it increased the cost to the landlord initially. They had to insulate every property. They had to have heating that would make it 18 degrees consistently in the main room. They had to have extractor fans, bathroom, kitchen. They had to have the draft things so While the cost to the owner initially was very, very high, it brought the standard of property up to a great level, which had the the rent. Simple. Tenants stayed longer. There wasn't the downtime. The demand was greater. So people felt better of themselves. So if there's going to be a short term hit, you've got to look at absorbing that in the first instance to get the long term gain. Right, so please take that into consideration going forward over the next two years of these uh, these sort of changes coming. I guess the good thing about that is A, you can just pass it on. You know, just keep passing down the food, the food chain to the tenant. Um, however, like the good part about that is that inflation doesn't discriminate. Right? Like everything you're spending your money on every day, uh, you get paid, your money goes into whatever you buy, food or you know, the TV or whatever, everything's going up in value. Um, it doesn't discriminate, so you want to make sure your cash flow is going up equally as much as the inflation is going around throughout there. So, having a pro proactive that property manager on your team is important. So. Yeah, well, I really back my guys. They, they really work hard for you guys. Um, the amount of hours they put in, the things you don't see behind the money coming through the door is really, really uh, important for you. So they do a really good job on that. So, last thing I want to chat about is the um, landlord insurance. Terry Shears, the EBU, things like that. You all probably have it. Can you put it in show of hands if you don't have landlord insurance? Don't be shy. <laughs> so, you get a few. That's a good shy man down there. Excellent. We really recommend, and I'll come and talk to you later, that you get a landlord policy in place. You know, we're finding at the moment tenants are just absconding from properties with no uh, warning at all. With New South Wales, Max will give some few horror stories where we've turned up to basically find out if the tenants still there. They're vacated, but all the furniture's still there. All their rubbish is still there. And the cost comes down to the landlord to get it all out. In your insurance policy, they will not cover 
rubbish removal, cost of exit cleaning, pest control, over the amount of bond we've got. We can only claim four weeks bond, right? So one example of Max had is rubbish removal at $1,800. We only had four weeks bond, only a thousand dollars for this historical. So the land was automatically out of pocket eight hundred dollars. Yes, it's good for the rent reimbursement, the loss of rent. But you just got to make sure that your uh, insurers are on your side. So you take the time to check the policy, make sure you cover the lot. Um, I was talking to Philip earlier on from Queensland. They have a couple of items up there that have got damages to the units of fifty grand plus. Now we know the insurers, they want to try and get out of it if they can. So our job becomes very difficult trying to talk them into honoring their policies. That's, take some time, check your policy out, and see what you can come back with. Okay, because you don't want to be left out. We want to limit your liability wherever possible, but you guys got to help us as well. I go to say like if you don't have landlord insurance, like everyone's going to actually put their hands up. But like if you don't have landlord insurance, it's like it's very, very bad. Um, it is reckless to your position because like quite often there's an issue whether it be a tenant of scotting, whether the tenant does damages, whatever the case may be. But, uh, I know it's being recorded, but so be it. Um, I actually get very fucking excited when a tenant travels to the property. I don't know I've got my insurance in place, you know, you can get a free rent. I had a, had a property, uh, I won't say the location, but it's in Queensland. Um, it's going through insurance at the moment. But I um, think um, one of my team here manages it, but uh, apparently, the tenant absconded from the property, cats walk into it, and they piss everywhere, the cats. And you can't hear the cat piss, so the house has to be knocked down. Right? Yeah. So it looks like they get a total loss for the property. And that should be in the vicinity of a few hundred thousand, like maybe 400. So like, when I hear stories like that, I'm like, oh, it sounds fucking bad. But if you didn't have the right assurance, you didn't have the right managers, you didn't have the right process, you didn't have the right um, the compliance around that, like the reporting on that. Um, you know, the insurance company is trying to say you know, all these different things, but the facts are the facts. And you know, at the end of the day, when they do pay up, like I've had so many, I've had four houses burned down, which is tremendous. So, yeah. <laughs> the insurance company pays a lot more than what you know, the market does. But um, the insurance is very important to have it in place. And I think a lot of people are underinsured and don't have the right you know, things in place. Over the years, we've seen lots of uh, different things that have occurred, and uh, really important to have the have the compliance because the insurance company will try to get out of that insurance as much as they can. So you basically need to be a lawyer to try and you know defeat the, the legal parameters of the insurance policy. But and just to that, if you're down the yeah. If you smoke like down the stretch, so yeah. Okay. So when we have an opt-in policy here with Smoke Alarm Australia and New South Wales, they will go to the different property units you might get out of it and have an opportunity to buy them. Uh, 100 bucks plus GST, which is tax deductible, your property is given a compliance certificate. So any insurer looks at that and says, shit. Sure. And, and then if they fail to do their thing, well then you've got them on leg limits and you can sue their insurance company and get your insurance company. I'm not saying that you're going to do that, but you want to protect yourself as much as you get. So in Queensland, where they have uh, the same type of legislation on, they're one of the workers that they're talking to my group. Make sure that your compliance and smoke alarms and a hard wire is up to standard. Because if they're not, it's up to you to go and out for insurance. Different legislative requirements for different states. We cut it off. Just make sure you know your property is not your own. Ask your man, ask your property manager. Just make sure you can find Put yourself uh, in a state where you don't have to worry about your property. Uh, this is a job for you guys. The less that you have to worry about them, the better it's going to be for you. Try and reduce your stress, put your liability, and do all the things that are assisted. Travel as well. Yeah, of course, you can do it.
The second topic I'm going to talk about is uh, entering the contracts to purchase the property and then just some wills and estate planning. So um, with the property law updates, um, so something recent that's come out is if you're selling a property and if the property is, the contract price is more than 750000 as a seller you have to get an ATO clearance certificate, uh, basically just to confirm that you're an Australian resident for tax purposes. If you don't provide that, then the buyer under the contract will retain 12.5% of the price and pay it to the ATO on your behalf. And that's basically to cover any capital gains tax liabilities that you might have. So that's one of the uh, recent updates. Another one is, um, lucky we're buying properties. Like lucky we're buying, right? Some people are selling. No, under that, like we're working people. Oh, under 750. Yeah, because the commies, they're trying to make all else true. So the next point is the, um, the first home buyer's choice. So I don't know if you guys um, heard about that um, the incentive that the government brought out last year about um, swapping the upfront stamp duty for an annual property levy. So they scrapped that, so that's no longer applicable for first home buyers. But as of the 1st of July, they increased the threshold for first home buyers. So I think it was up to 650,000, didn't have to pay stamp duty. They've increased that up to 800,000. And there's a concessional rate of duty now uh, between 800 and a million. So you get a discounted stamp duty, but that's only for first home buyers. Um, but that's something that's recently changed. Um, purchase and surcharge duty, so a lot of our clients are Australian citizens or permanent residents, but if you're not, if you're a foreign national and you want to buy property in Australia, you have to get um, uh, you have to get approval from the Foreign Investment Review Board, and then if you get approval in New South Wales, you have to pay an extra 8% stamp duty, to 8% of the contract price. So recently, they've changed that, whereby there's, I think, about eight countries now that um, don't... <laughs> <laughs> Don't send any naked pictures or anything else. Like <laughs> Sorry, that's uh, yeah, it's probably more exciting than what I was talking about. So. Um, yeah, so if you're, if you're a foreign national and um, you're from one of those selected eight countries, you no longer have to pay the search up stamp duty. Um, and that's because of the inconsistencies with the government's international tax treaty. So, so, so if you're, if you're um, 
So you don't have to worry about food as a boss, that's right. Um, you still have to worry about firms, so you still have to get approval. But if you're a foreign national from, there was a list of eight countries, it was like India, South, uh, South Africa, and all these, about eight countries where, common. yeah, if you're a national of those countries, you don't have to pay extra stamp duty. So you still have to get approval to purchase, but you don't have to pay extra stamp duty. You don't have to pay 8% or whatever. That great start. Stimulate the economies of all. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, and the last one, which you guys have probably heard of, it's the Shared Equity Home Buyer Program, which was where the government put out an incentive just for a select group of people, um, whereby they will purchase a property with you, up to 40% interest in the property. So obviously they'll contribute up to 40% of the contract price, but they'll also be on title for up to 40% of ownership of the property. Um, it's only for um, single parents um, and key workers, like uh, for the first time buyers, nurses, teachers, and police officers. So that's something that, that came out uh, a few months ago, I think. Um, so there are all the property law updates. Um, Entering a contract to purchase a property. So a lot of you guys buy properties sort of in New South Wales, in Queensland, in WA. Uh, the process is slightly different in each state. So in New South Wales, uh, you get a statutory five business day cooling off period. Um, we normally recommend you get at least a 10 business day cooling off period. So the cooling off period is for the purpose of us to give you advice on the contract. You guys see it your loan formally approved and get your inspection reports done. Um, in New South Wales, if you pull out for any reason before the end of the cooling off period, you'll forfeit your initial 0.25% deposit. Um, and time is of the essence in relation to the cooling off period. So if you don't get it extended, um, you have to decide whether you either pull out or proceed before five o'clock on the deadline. If you don't, then you're locked in. So if you don't have loan approval, um, it's probably not a good idea to, uh, to be locked in, but that's where we work with getting extensions and we work with your broker to make sure that sort of everyone's on the same page. Um, in Queensland, you do get a statutory five day cooling off period, but that cannot be extended. So in Queensland, we do recommend that the contract also has conditions like subject to satisfactory pest and building, subject to satisfactory finance, and uh, also due diligence inquiries. So um, under those contracts, you can pull out if your finance gets declined under the finance condition. Um, if there's major issues in your pest and building, you can pull out under that condition. And the due diligence is basically anything else, including if we get a strata report or the advice on the contract. Um, the difference with the Queensland contracts in that respect is if you um, request an extension, you don't get an extension. After five o'clock on that due date, the contract continues on foot, um, but the seller then also has a right to pull out of the contract. So then it's basically first in. So if the seller pulls out first, well then the contract's at an end. But if you satisfy those conditions before the seller pulls out, then the contract's still on foot. Uh, but we obviously give you the advice in that regard so you know what you're doing. Um, WA, so with WA there's no cooling off period at all. Um, so it's really important that um, you have the right clauses in those contracts. Um, it's usually a subject to finance approval. Um, with WA, that's usually the first condition, so you can't really do anything else until you get your finance approved. Um, once you get your finance approved, then you can get your pest and building inspections done. Um, however, the, the clauses in WA are very strict, so you can really only pull out under pest and building if like, there's major structural issues um, or like live termites that affect the structural soundness of the building, uh, actually of the residential dwelling. So, um, and then you have to give the seller a right to remedy the repairs, and it's only if they don't then remedy the repairs and they are structural defects that you can pull out. So it, it, there's a lot more involved there. Do you get up, like in Queensland, you also get a five day cooling off period as well, but in Western Australia, do you get that or not? Yeah, no, no. Nothing? No. There we go. So for that reason, um, we recommend that you put it, you would get a due diligence condition in the WA contracts. Um, and, sorry, and the, other, the other thing is that I realised is that the lawyers over there, they're not lawyers, they're just like cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, who's more in WA? And who found that the, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, they're not lawyers, so that's the big difference, right? And it's a big difference between conveyancing and a lawyer. Steve pulls it apart, he's like, no, 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 not this, not this. It's fun dealing with them. Um, so, and with the due diligence clause in WA, um, the way that it's drafted is that if you don't get it extended, if you don't satisfy it, the contract automatically terminates. So um, it's really important that we you know, pay attention to those due dates and make a decision wisely as to what we can do. Um, the last point I'm going to talk about is wills and estate planning. 
So um, I pretty much talk about this at every event, um, but it's super important, so I'll like, talk about it again. Let's play a game first. Okay. So this is our personal fish run. Who has a will? Okay, let's get all hands down. Who doesn't have a will? Who we go, right? Who has a car? Who, who has car insurance? Who doesn't have car insurance? <laughs> so you got to show your 10 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand car, 50 grand car, 100 grand car, whatever. But you've got your life's work and um, there's something that happened. I've seen articles, I've heard about stories where you know, someone dies and then the spouse has to go through probate and all that sort of stuff to try and get their own property back and their own stuff. So you've worked hard your whole life, something goes wrong. I always think oh, I'm dead, I don't have to worry about it, but you know, you've got to think about your life lines, all your you work and you pass it down in a generational world. And I think it's very important, like you, you, you go and spend a thousand dollars for the process of getting an insurance for your car or whatever, the will is the thing that's really you know, underrated, people don't realise it and don't have it. Uh, just out of the simple things of being able to operate from the other side of the grave. Um, does it apply just to property, or does it also apply to children and where you want them to go? Or what? All assets. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So basically, for a ballot bill, so everyone knows what a will is. It's basically a document that outlines your intentions for distribution of your assets after your death. Um, the requirements for a valid will are it has to be in writing. Um, it needs to be witnessed by two independent witnesses, um, and essentially, if you if you don't have a will, it, it'll take longer to distribute your estate or your assets. It'll cost more money to distribute your assets and your assets might not go to who you. So 
you've got, you've got a birthday present coming up. Just yeah. those right. Oh, good question. Who reckons she's a lizard? <laughs> The fact that people laugh at that is that people would even think that, right? Anyway, we're on a recording, right? Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so most of the consensus is is that for homeowners, it's unlikely there's going to be a change in stance or a change in policy from Philip Lowe. Philip Lowe, I want to see his name wrong. So what that means is that they're still thinking that inflation still has some way to come down. There's obviously mechanisms that they have in place to try and bring those, that, that down. And obviously the main tool that they have is monetary policy. So interest rates may go up another quarter of percentage points. Nathan, we stop predicting it's too hard. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It to some extent it doesn't matter, but it does matter. But what it means is, is that there's a couple of things. One, if, if everyone's saying there may be one, that means you probably would peaked out, right? So we're probably not going to see too many more unless things become really wild and aggressive in terms of the economy. I don't think that's the case. The second is, is that she is the first female governor. So in 63 years, that's the first female governor. Interesting fact, there's only been nine governors. They have a pretty long term, right? Because they're puppets. <laughs> <laughs> and so what you find is, is that she's probably going to make a legacy for herself, a legacy for the fact that she's the first female governor. So we should see something more interesting than a lot of the vanilla that we've been seeing over the last couple of decades, right? So I think in terms of what everyone's expecting, everyone's expecting that there's going to be a rate dive. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think he's going to try and drive this car really slowly, really collectively with everyone else, understanding the pulse. So I think if you're looking at this from a taxation point of view, from an investor point of view, what you want to understand is, is what Nathan is saying. Does it make a difference to you? Yes, it does at the end of the month. But how are you going to use that to your advantage? Because if properties stay where they're staying, rates stay where they're staying, then you probably have advantageous buying opportunities. Right? So it's important for you guys to understand that these are tools, these are mechanisms which you use to your advantage. Because it is what it is. Whether it's Michelle, whether it's Nathan becoming the RBA governor, I what you would do, actually. I would put the fucking car. I would drive that fucking ride off the cliff, right? I realize like, that's what we meant to do, right? We just get over and up with it. Or we could do the right thing and stop robbing everybody with inflation. We could just, you know, crash all the property prices, crash everything, and actually have a sad money. But that's not fun. You're not going to, you're not going to. You know, it's no fun with that. You need to, the scan is there that made the system, and you would just go on foot by foot on the pedal. It's like, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> so I think that's probably what we're going to expect out of this governor, not this one. Um, <laughs> so what we probably find, though, is, is that the government in power now, Labor, is probably going to be in a position where there's a lot of pressure going to be put on them to do things that you've seen, I think Chris touched on it, having a, a rental commission, I think, put in, that was earlier this week, for example. So using fiscal policy, using different mechanisms from the government to be able to con control inflation, I think is going to be the flavor for the next two or three years before Labor has to go for a re-election. So I think you get a lot of, a lot of the same from, from the new RBA government. So I think it's important for you guys, again, to understand that. If there are caps on rents, what does that do for property prices? So you've got to use all these different different levers and tools and mechanisms. I was just speaking with Jason, one of our clients here, is, you know, what does that look like for yourself, for your children? What is the immigration policy that's coming through for the next couple of years going to do with property? You're all good property investors. None of you are bad. None of you are doing anything which is probably, what a lot of people are doing is running for the hills, right? So you're using these tools to your advantage. So you've got to continue doing that. Does anybody have any comments on what they think they're expecting the RBA to do? Free for all, anyone. Up. Who thinks it's going to go up? Who thinks it's going to go down? Steady two months. Didn't think about it. They, they should have thought about it a long time ago. Well, they did. It was all true. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, what, one other thing. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about the other week. Like, what is the, you know, everyone's like, oh, is it going to be this commie or that commie, right? And liberal, like, which puff are we going to put on, right? And like, when you look at it, it's like you just had a Liberal Party, which was the most spending whatever, right? They put all these things on, right? 
the job keeper, everything, right? I just want to get tattooed and move on. So great, all these tax incentives, I'm trying to make tattoos, all that sort of stuff. But um, when you look at like what little scams that they're playing, right? One thing I realized recently, and we talked about this recently on the, I think you're on the Facebook Live or a podcast, recently they've put the super up to 9%, 9.5%, 9.5% to 10%, and now 10% to 11%, and they're going to take up to 4%. And if you think about it, what they are doing is that they are taking 1% of your wage every week, right? 1% of everybody's wage here and putting it into a super. And what do they do with that? It? It's like a new printing press, it's a big Ponzi scheme, right? They can do fractional reserve on it, they can then lend it back to themselves. What's your super invested into? People don't even know where the super fund is, right? You've got a quarter million bucks, a half a million bucks. What's your super invested into? We've all seen, who's seen the big short? Who's seen Wolf of Wall Street? It's a communist version of those two put together, right? That's where your money is, right? So what control do you have over there? You've got a quarter of a million bucks, you're adding into it, put an extra one percent in, your boss is taking your money and giving it to the super, he goes in there. And then what are they doing? They're creating more liquidity in the system so they can draw more bonds from your super fund. So they're just basically creating liquidity for that and they're creating more liquidity to put into these paper asset markets such as the stock market or future markets. And, Go from there, which is really interesting to see that they're actually pushing those levers. The other one is bringing 700,000 new migrants to the country because we have more taxpayers to help pay us trillion dollars worth of debt that they've created. And if you look at the trillion dollars worth of debt, it was pretty easy to pay when it was at 10 basis points, so it was like a trillion dollars a year, but now it's 410 basis points. Um, it's now 41 billion dollars a year, which is bigger than the size of Medicare. So just putting things in perspective like that, they're totally screwed. Anyway, I don't know. Just mathematics. It was a good segue there, Smith. But I think that you sent me that as a text, and it hadn't hit me before because he was he was saying it. He's like, it's super just got to eleven percent. I was like, yeah, it did. Because he goes, that's just more money into the share market. And I actually thought about it for a sec because a lot of what he says, I have to sort of you know filter it in my brain. <laughs> I said, you know, actually it's a good point because if 0.5% of everyone's super is increased and it all goes virtually to the share market, obviously there's a big SMSF market, that means the share market should get a lot more liquidity, the fund managers get a lot more liquidity, so they make the share market go a little bit higher each you know, quarter or year. So it's interesting to say that whether or not you know where your super fund is, so a lot of people don't realise this is that, and you probably do actually, I shouldn't say that, a lot of people outside of this room wouldn't realise. Who knows? Who knows how much they've got in their super fund? That was my question, but sure. Oh, sorry. Half of you does it. His question, who does it? Who does it? Okay. Because when you know, anyone not know what's in the super fund, right today? How much? How much? Okay, cool. Everyone who knows? Yeah, I like you guys. A lot of people like. So what's interesting though is, is that the government have a pretty protectionist policy with regard to super. So they don't want people to pull their superannuation out, have control to be able to invest it. Not because they don't think it's the right thing, it's because generally speaking they think that individuals aren't capable of administering and manage, managing their super in an efficient and in, in essence of the, the law in a sole purpose way. A sole purpose being to pay for your retirement at the end, okay? So they say that, you know, if you have an industry fund, or if you have a super wear super, Australian super, whatever it is, they're investing, it's in the hands of professionals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what you've got to remember is, is that, like what Nathan constantly says is, is that pull your super out and put your property. We can't necessarily say that, but the premise is the same. So all the buildings that you see in the city, a lot of them are owned by large super funds. So if you look at the, the um, the metro, what's the metro called? The light rail in the city, right? That was funded in part by large super funds, both locally and abroad, right? So Canadian Super was a major funder to that actual infrastructure project, right? So if you think about it on a, on a large enough scale, that when you're taking your super out and trying to put it into property, which a lot of people say you shouldn't do because concentration risk and all these other things, which in part sometimes is true, at the other end of the spectrum, yes, they're in shares, they're in all these other things, but a lot of them are in these big, mega, monolithic buildings, right? So at the end of the day, they're also in property. So it's all intertwined, it's all it's all sort of all one part of each other. Last week, um, <coughs> Westfield in San Francisco just handed the keys back and walked the fuck out of the line. Does anyone know that? Yeah? yeah? Who didn't know that? 
here we go. So Westfield, the largest shopping centre, right? You're in you're super fun. Let's say you're Westfield, right? You don't go and go, oh, let's call up CBA and we'll get a valuation next week. We'll call Rose and we'll re refinance <laughs> you know, mortgage to like, you know, get a 95% off pay a little bit of mortgage insurance and we'll get another trillion dollars to put a car park on. They don't do that, right? You know, we'll get some capital. We'll go to our other mates over here. They've got a, a cool Wolf of Wall Street thing happening. We'll then, you know, do something there, punch some books, make some numbers up, create a new asset. We'll then go and pitch it and get all our mates to put money in and fund it. And that's where you have these REITs and all these things. But it's very easy. Like, do you think you have a commercial real estate trust or whatever your money's invested? Do you think you own a part of the building? You own the loan is where your money's at and not recourse with some good terms attached to it that is then tapped into as a financial product. You never looked at it from that perspective. And that's exactly right. Well said. Yeah. So that, that's the reality of what it is, right? So the product that you're investing in is a financial asset, is a financial instrument that gets funded into something like that, like a big infrastructure type um, play. And so in that scenario there, you've got uh, a fund which is owning, you know, what otherwise would be a triple A asset, with potentially triple A tenants, Myers, Woolies, the whole works. But then the actual owner of the building says, "Hang on, we can't actually make good on the next loan renewal that we have to do because in America it's a five-year loan renewal commercial, and the cap rates have gone through the roof because everything is now empty, all virtually empty, <laughs> and so then they have to walk away from that whole thing. So there's a write down that comes through. That write down comes back through to your super." and sits in your super fund, and you all share the risk of all these different types of assets and investments that they do. So self-managed super fund is a way <clears throat> to be able to harness that control, put it into an asset you know, potentially an asset class you love. It's not necessarily for everyone. You might not have the balance, you might not have the acumen, but it's certainly something you can consider. Um, so a lot of clients have come through us. We sent them through some information with regards to how that works. I think the IR team has been talking to a lot of people with regard to how it works. Something you consider, certainly something that you need to, in a conspiracy world that Nathan often talks about to me, is, is that the, the, the retail super fund lobby is extremely strong, right? So they're the ones who put all these curtailments inside of the self managed super fund world because it draws capital out of their world into, back into your world kind of thing, right? So you just gotta be mindful of the fact that it could be useful, it might not be for you right now, but it also means that you've got to look at your overarching portfolio on a bit of a timeline. So we used to say back in the day is that you always go through acquisition, consolidation, either disposal or reacquisition, right? So one of these three states. When you're in consolidation, you might not have enough money to go up to Sumit or to Rose to say, hey, get me another property, but you might have enough in super to start that process again. So you you're invest sorry? Your servicing might be a company that under your personal Correct. Account, but possibly still buy under your super fund because it's a different it's a different servicing yeah. criteria, right? Because they're leaning on the ten and a half or eleven percent now that comes in through work. So if you've got a job, they can look at that. So a lot of people use these two or three worlds that they have, could be personal, super, trust to continue the ball rolling and that's how they get to those you know, larger numbers in terms of um, properties. Yeah. And ask you, I guess, like, the thing I think everyone should be asking is, the first thing, how much money do I have for my super? The second one is, who is my super fund? Who knows who their super fund is? We asked that before, yeah? Yes, we asked that. The better question will be, who knows what your super fund is invested into? Yeah, like I mean specifically, like if it's in shares and say 100 grand in the shares, what shares? Yeah, what was that person? Who's the person? Who knows who the person is that manages and moves it around inside their super? You know the physical person inside the super fund. Oh, if it's you. Yeah, it's great, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? That's great. <laughs> but then, like, what was the action that your super fund took? Um, in the 10th of February 2021, before the market took off a cliff and dropped, everyone's like, well, my super fund jumped back up tremendously. I had 100 grand, it went down to 80 grand or 70 grand, then it went back to 110 on the head, right? But then we pulled inflation data and you could have bought Gumby Man shit three years ago that you couldn't buy now. So, what has your super fund done? And there's the question whether it's in property, whether it's in shares, whether it's in managed funds, whether it's in whatever, what control do you have over that, which I think is important.
Yeah. Absolutely. So I think it's similar to what Stephen said here, is, is that, um, what I think Nathan said, is that wills you know, are highly underutilized, estate management is highly underutilized and under-resourced. I think super kind of falls into that gap. For a lot of you guys, because you're really pro-property, then it makes sense to make that jump to say, okay, well, can I mobilize my super to be able to get into property? So that's good. But if you haven't thought about it, it's like Nathan said, you don't necessarily need to do self-managed super fund, but be cognizant of where your super is, how it's invested, what it's invested in. A lot of the super funds which were investing in tech stocks in the last four or five years have pulled back dramatically because obviously they've fallen off a cliff. The new tech is AI, so everyone's running around throwing money at AI, hoping it sticks. So you've got to be careful because you don't want to be that person. I used to be a, um, a stockbroker a long, long time ago. I used to work for an advisory company. And, um, and I traded through the GFC, so it was quite, now it seems hilarious, but it was quite interesting then. And people who were, who were retiring literally called us up and said, hey, my fund's gone from 600K and I was gonna be able to retire for the next 10 years, it's now 400, what do I do? And I'm like, uh, I don't know, like as in, we didn't have any answers, right? It was really unprecedented. So you don't wanna be caught short, right? And that's the reality, depending on when you retire, health, all these other different things, it's good to have a plan, so things like your estates, good to have potentially some financial goals, which all of you have, but also then checking out your super. So if you do want to know more about that, ask the team, we can certainly help you out. <coughs> now number three is Nathan's second favorite topic after his children, is inflation versus interest rates. Now Nathan, I'm going to ask you a question. Do we need a new tool, and what is the tool? So inflation is always targeted using interest interest rates. That's the, that's the big hammer they have. Right. It's not working that well. It's not working, so what is it? Tell me. Well, they're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way. They can't fix it, right? We've got one more cycle of this, and uh, I said this off five years ago, six years ago. Everyone thought it was off my head, literally in this room, right? It was. Yeah. Anyone who to the last time in this room? Anyone here? I said a lot was off my head, though. <laughs> the things I was saying was really crazy, and, uh, you know. Oh, we're going to see the interest rates go down to zero. We're going to see a, a recession like never seen beforehand, etc. And um, here we are. So the next cycle that we have, it's only one cycle left in this system, and that will end up with the hyperinflation. So whatever way they do, they push the interest rates up. We're seeing a market which is booming when interest rates from crashing markets. So it's booming, everything's booming. Um, it's adding to the inflation. So at some point, you're going to have to take their foot off the brake of it. And the minute that they can see defeat by reversing the course of monetary policy, the minute people give up their back for their hope on cash and money. And that's the way to lose our currency, like every other currency guys. Yeah, look, I think you're not far off. I'd probably make a slightly bolder statement and say that that they're not going to use monetary policy anymore to try and tackle inflation. They're going to use quite um, BSG. Sorry? BSG. Yeah, well, PSG is one, yeah, it's like a topic at the moment, but I think what you'll find is, is that there'll be a lot of price capping. So there was a time when certain things had prices, even in this country, they had price caps. At the moment, they obviously have, you know, Labor, they have minimum standards for labor, which is good. Um, but they have price caps on foods, they should have price caps on ABCD, rents, those type of things, right? Now, what's telling Nathan is, is that the only thing they don't have price caps on is landlords, right? So at the moment, landlords seem to be quite an untouched area for them in terms of how they can regulate and control things. So they're talking about rents at the moment. So how are we going to cap these rents? So what do they do with properties? So they say, hey, you can only earn, own X amount of properties. I'm not sure if anybody read, there was an article this week in the Sydney Morning Herald. Did anybody read that? About landlords. So they had two weeks ago that the rental prices paper, and this week they had the, the landlord side. So it was really interesting. We've talked about it many times. So what do you guys think are the top 40 professions for landlords in this country? Yellow Mountain. Who's that? Politicians. Politicians? No. Trades. There's one. Teachers. Two. Teachers. Three. Barrister. No. What? Barrister. No. Yeah. Teachers. Teachers. Surgeons was one. Yeah, surgeons was number one. I was, was the outlier. Surgeon was one. And next to the it's not real estate agents. That's true. <laughs> so they released the top 40 professions for landlords in Australia, earning between one and six properties, right? So I think we had our fourth or fifth at the Hills Lodge, and they came out with the stats saying less than one percent of 
point zero point zero percent. Yeah, it's about point zero eight now. So less than twenty. Yeah, yeah it's about less than twenty thousand. Twenty thousand, twenty maybe twenty one thousand. Less than 20,000 people that have six or more properties. But that's gone up 200% since 2014. Okay, yeah, we'll be helping everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was interesting was it was us, it was the people in this room who are the landlords, but the narrative, the political narrative, the media narrative is that it's, you know, on the point of Nathan, people like Nathan who own hundreds of properties, for example, or doctors or barristers, all the things that we all think. It's the, it's the baby boomers. Yeah, it's more baby boomers. They actually said baby boomers, right? There's a lot of concentration of wealth there. But it's not, it's people like us, everyday working, hard Australians, even accountants that are And so we own the properties, but in terms of, I guess, all of the odds, people who are on really high incomes have good incomes, have good lives, have disposable incomes. I had a client today on 900K, as a $15 million property paid off. We said, hey, why don't you speak to be invested and get some properties? Because you know, I haven't got plenty to put in the fuel tank, right? Because their life cycle and their lifestyle is so big, it's hard. It's like, you know, people in this room have 10, 12, some of you, I know more properties than that, right? And that's a, that's, you know, that's a, the obvious huge acumen to what you guys have done, but also the strength you put into it, also the time you put into it. But what's important is, is that at the moment, there's no cap on housing. There's no cap on what landlords can do. But they're going to start bringing up land tax rates. They're going to start capping rents. They're going to do all these things to be able to control how the economy inflates, right? Property is probably one of the, the last bastions of autonomy. Um, so it's important that you guys understand that. Continue to invest in it. And I think that's what's going to be... You know, my bold statement is that they're going to try and go after this area like, even more so. I had a thought, right, and like, Rin, like if you go on WhatsApp, like Rin's like number one on WhatsApp, and um, I always text him all the time, like random shit, like and sometimes he lives his life precariously, he says all the time through me, like, man, this, I wouldn't be doing that, it's funny. But um, I was thinking when Chris was saying beforehand about all the commie stuff that I put on and try and, you know, like, you can only cap it or whatever, right? Then I thought about it, so the barely talking about parameters of what you're dealing with the government with, right? What about if everyone isn't just like random off topic? <laughs> Imagine if we built a business that was decided, right? And the business rented everybody's properties for whatever fuck they wanted it for. And then everyone that wants to join in that becomes like a subscriber to it. So they're not paying rent. So who are they going to go after? The big corporation that owns all the rental and owns all the leases of the property? Or we'll just go and put a lease service program on properties and then we'll just get around it. I'm sure he probably sits there sometimes with like a crazy girlfriend sent like 20, like 10, 20 messages talking to herself at the same time. He's probably getting like, oh, man, she's this, this, this. No, I always message back. He always mentions something funny, so I'm laughing. He says, you talk to me, it's like, yeah, you can see me, but I can't show it. <laughs> Um, so we're we'll getting to the end of it. So um, taxation in the future. Um, so UBI and Ethan's talked about that a lot, and I'll probably just talk about it a little bit more. That's, um, not, a, that's not a sexually transmitted decision. <laughs> <laughs> Universal basic income. <laughs> um, bigger tax brackets, that's coming this year. So 2024 State Street tax cuts are at this stage. I think Al Gore was asked a couple of weeks ago, and he said that this stage is not opposing it. So your tax brackets from the middle bracket is going all the way, I think, from Forty-five to two hundred thousand dollars, eighty thousand. Um, it's all getting taxed at 30 percent. So anyone who's on that middle tax bracket, who's at thirty-two, thirty-seven, all those different rates, it's all going to come down to thirty percent, which fuels inflation. Despite what everyone thinks, it does. You'll have more money. You'll spend more money. The government makes more money because they're taxing people more because they're pushing people's money to be more as well. Yeah. So I think that the, the wider scope of it is is, is that it, it starts to lend itself to say, okay, great. To what extent can people live on a certain amount of money? If we can find a normalized rate of tax for everyone, does that work? Does that stop the complaints? If everyone's on 20% and everyone's kind of comfortable, or 30% and everyone's kind of comfortable, does that work? Right? They're trying to figure this out in the event that UBI, things like AI, although it sounds very you know catastrophizing that AI is going to take all our jobs, there will be a significant impact that uh, occurs. I have a number of clients who, for example, work for tech companies, and they're all telling me the same that 
the rate of pace of change for industry workers, whether it's in technology industry, service, hospitality, real estate, whatever it might be, accounting, it's, it's quite rapid, right? So they've got to figure out a way how they can make everyone understand, okay, this is what you get. So that could be, hey, if you're, if you're paying rent, this is the max you'll pay. If you're getting, um, if you're paying a mortgage, this is the max you'll pay. Um, trying to figure out all these nice in-betweens. So, they're using it to their advantage. The way they're using it at the moment, we've been speaking about for a while, is data matching. It's incredibly good now. Like it was really good four years ago. It's crazy now. Like they actually have a significant amount of data on us, which is real time. They can access. It's pretty scary. <coughs> the tax office is using it more and more. We get you know audit reviews for the clients depending on what they've done, for example, and they'll pull in data from external places saying your client did A, B, C, D we just allow this deduction, right? And it's pretty impressive to see what's happening, but all of it is being used in some sort of way, not in a conspiratorial way, but in a way which they're trying to navigate this world as well, right? To work out, okay, to what extent should the tax brackets be two instead of three, or three instead of four? Or should company tax rates go down so the companies can make more profits and can they pay their, the workers more? If the workers are gonna get fired or they're gonna get redundant because of AI, is there a bigger social security pool? All these things are the things that are trying to mull over and work out. So it's important that you guys understand that the reason you're here is because you want some independence away from that, right? If with properties, with assets, you can control a certain element of your financial future. So that's why you've got to think about it more and more closely. And I think that's why there's such a big discussion about first owners, people getting into the property market, all these different the rental prices which is going on. They've got the $10 billion future fund, actually forgot about it, but they're building 30,000 homes, the government is consisting with that, right? So they're well, really- Yeah, other than that. And they need to stimulate all those bills. <laughs> but I think what they're trying to look at is to say, okay, if we can get housing for everyone, if we can get a basic level of income for everyone, if we can get a basic level of lifestyle for everyone, then, then AI is not gonna make as big of an impact as it could in the event that we don't actually get this under control. So something to think about, probably something to use more motivation to invest in what you guys have been doing. Now lucky last, obviously it's tax time now, so I'm seeing some of you and anyone who's, um, anyone who's looking at the tax um, situation at the moment, you're getting less of a refund now because LMITO is over. So, you know, don't blame me, don't shoot me. Um, you can blame the government. So you're not getting the incentive that you were last year. So the tax returns are looking a little bit lower. What's important and probably more important because people are getting lower and lower refunds over the last years, they're probably going to up this year because of interest rates, is, is that these properties are going to suffice for either financial independence for you now, some level of freedom, or likely is, is that some retirement planning and some retirement independence whenever that comes. So it's important to understand how both super properties you have now and what it's going to look like for you in the future um, is going to look at the retirement or the point end of the stage. That doesn't mean what you life. That doesn't mean that you retire at 67. It might be 57, but what does that all look like? These properties are going to give you the options to be able to make those decisions at some particular point. How, if you have properties one, three, seven, and eight, how are they? Are they the ones you're going to carry through to retirement? Are they really intensive in terms of repairs? Or are they easy going? Are they, are they easily rented? Have they fared during COVID? Are they essential workers locations? What does it all look like? Are they regional? Did you buy something just to get cash flow to be able to jump into another property? Is that going to feature in your retirement? Those are the things you should, should be talking about with us, with Nathan. Say, so, okay, great. What does this property portfolio look like in 10 years? Because if you're stuck at, hey, I've got to fix the AC now, I hate this property, I want to sell it, but you're not looking about what it's going to do for you in 10 years, that's the, that's the worst thing that we see for clients because they get frustrated with the busyness and the headaches and the stress of the property, but they don't think, hey, what's going to happen in five or six years. So that's a really important point. I think that try to zoom out of the tax. Tax is important. Tax will be there. Tax will be there till the day you die. But the properties will be the more things that you pass on and will help you in that sort of retirement, so retirement any, age. Does anyone work at Service New South Wales? I think we a client who was there. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Well, I won't offend anyone. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I was in the car the other week, right? It's had a stressful afternoon. It's a Friday afternoon, right? And I had like a call, I didn't even know it. It was like, it was about some decisions I had to make about a camp and some other things. It was like three in the afternoon. And I had to make a decision by three, by four o'clock. And I had like five different things. My phone just kept blowing, 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 blowing. 
And then I was like, I just turned around, I had some in my car, and I was like, man, I just wish that, like, could, like just wanted to be left alone on a Friday afternoon, but this is fucking stressful, right? It was a stressful afternoon. And it's the guy, he's an old guy, he's like handy system. He goes, well, you could go get a job in service New South Wales if you don't want to deal with the stress. And I, it was just like a cloud of, like, like it was like a weight lifted off my shoulder. I was like, fuck, this is all worth it, right? It's like, because <laughs> I realized, like, what would my decision be like if I had the alternative? And sometimes it might feel like you're you know, bogged down with so much things that are on top of you, but then you know, it's all for a reason. Like you go, you know, you, you want to go to the gym, right? You go to the gym, you've got to get sore muscles and stuff, um, and you have to have that have growth. And sometimes people get scared, they just get turned around. It's like the gatekeepers, it's like the, the growth is not pushing through the gatekeeper. And, yeah, I've seen people over the years that have bought like 20 properties and oh wow the market's got up, I can sell the property make 50 grand, 100 grand on and they sell all their 20 properties and it's like shit you've got a couple of million bucks but it doesn't buy anything anymore. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so like when you deal with adver adversity that's where you get paid because yeah. the adversity is where that risk you're onboarding is the reward that you're chasing at the end of the day. I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's the crux. So I think um, one other thing that just on the fly, Chris mentioned that they, um, it was the minimum living standards. What was that? Where did you go? Yeah, the properties have a minimum, minimum property standard. So if they make you do all those things, which is interesting, um, then obviously those things fall into part of mandatory you know, requirements for for your property. So largely a lot of those costs will be tax deductible. Right? So if you are going through that process, make sure that your agent is capturing it, you're capturing it, keep all that paperwork and um, and yeah, don't be flustered by the properties as Nathan said, that the adversity is what gets you there in the end. And I think that if you look at it like A it's probably backed by BlackRock for that initiative anyway, so they may or spend all this money. But um, second thing is is that that'll push people out of the market, they'll be scared. And like at the time when you go, oh, I'm going to spend an extra two grand here, an extra two grand there, it can feel, you know, oh shit, why do I keep doing this? But as it pushes other people out, there's less people, it means there's less competition for your rental property, uh, like as far as other properties. And I would see that as short term pain, but in the longer term, it, it's, it's going to add inflation to your rents. So, my initial thoughts. Easy. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, if you like it, then maybe read some of our blogs. Okay. I always, always say to Rose, like, your team does so much, right? Every week, like, you're ripping at it. We're going to get some people up later. We're going to be looking through portfolios and different things that people are happy to share with their position. But the amount of work that you and the team put in, I don't think that they realize how great of the things, like, little movements. It's like a like a surgeon, like doing surgery, right? And transporting a heart, you know, and all that. It's like what you do is very delicate to make the portfolio grow. And without the finance, and you can't build. So very crucial. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first, is there a time that I should switch from in-person to P&I repayments? Let's just give you a background. The whole purpose, if it's for owner of the buy, obviously we do things for the like use of payments, so there's no question there. So we're talking here for investment loans. So we at the onset, if you're an investor, of course we will run it with you. If you want to be PI or interest only, it's up to you, but we put a recommendation. Most of it is going to be interest only. Interest only being because if it is interest only, you can maximize your cash flow and you can also maximize the tax benefit. Right? Now, if you're an interest only for maybe two or three years, we can then it goes back to PNI repayments. So with the PNI repayments, obviously higher repayments. Now some of you may not be able to afford the PNI, so that's when we're we come to refinancing to restart with it only. Now as you know, the loan is 30-year term, 
So the bank assesses it. If you are an interest only for five years, so the stream, the return, the way you do the, you do the um, servicing is only going five years. It's 30 years minus five years of interest only period. Now, when your interest only period expires, I would like to, I would like to recommend to continue the interest only. Only because, as I said, it's for cash flow purposes, maximize your cash flow, and also maximize your tax benefits. Now we would say, how would I do that? Well, Zing, of course, we can restructure your loan with an interest only. Now, interest only is, the only problem with that is that your loan will not go down because the capital is saying you're only paying the interest portion. But if it's for investment purposes, I'd rather you pay interest only and then pay more and more on your occupied loans because that is not tax deductible. So is that clear? Okay, let's look at self-employed simplified income verification. This is very dear to me. For simplified employees, oh, not employees, simplified borrowers, obviously the bank needs a lot of financial statements, tax returns, there's so many documentation required. Now, most of you own two or three companies. Now, if you do that, there will be a lot of financial statements that we ask from you. The bank come up with easy solution for you. You can be paying yourself through a self, through a pay slips. If you have pay slips, you have been paying yourself. The last six months, the bank will consider that income based from the pay slips. The only touch is some lenders would require an accountant that would confirm that that income is sustainable. Now, mostly it is sustainable, right? You're talking to your accountant. So if you have been paying yourself for the last six months, they require tax uh, salary credits. So if I'm paying myself for base of 100,000, then every month I would say a net income goes into my bank account. They would look at the last six months of that. Maybe you will look at the three months of salary credits, but you look at the year today, you have been paying yourself. Now, of course, a company read a letter from the company that says that it's a sustainable income. That is a very, very um, easy way to borrow if you're self-employed. But the, um, the downside of it is if you want to add the, the net profit before tax, which can help with your servicing, then case it may not be an option. Net profit before tax, this is basically the income that is generated by the company, but you're not distributing it to yourself or to anyone. So that could be an add back. Depreciation, net profit before tax, the superannuation that you pay more than the, uh, say for example, 11%, you're paying like 15% and add back the 3% of the superannuation. So in that way, it could also help present your financials. Now, there are lenders there that would only require one year of financials. I would like that because if you have two years of financials, if the last year is not good, they'll take the average. It's pulling the the income from the latest year. So also, some income that you have in your tax return may not be considered by the bank as an income for servicing purposes. Say, for example, the franking credits or franking amounts, the evidence that you receive from the company may not be as acceptable income for for the purpose of servicing, unless they say you consistently been received for the last two years. So speak to your accountant. Why would you be paying franking amounts instead of salaries and wages? I think there's a difference between that. I think uh, you have to correct me this one, uh, Ray one. The reason why they're paying franking amounts, because if you're paying salaries and wages, that means every quarter they need to do the tax implication, right? For the, uh, for the, for the, uh, as a, as a payway, uh, as a salaries. But if you go frankly, great, is that will be done towards the end of the financial year. So that's why you don't put it as uh, salaries and wages, you put it as a franking amounts. So remember, if you have any doubt what you want to put in your tax return, in your individual tax return, if you 
have any question, let me know. Because I could suggest to pay salaries and wages instead of fronting amounts. So, but the simplification of income verification is a way to go at the moment. Because if you have so many companies, I go crazy looking at those financial statements if you have three or four. But having the um, income, income verification through a payslip is a better option. Okay, let's look at uh, loan structuring. I'll test loan structuring first. Often I get clients that have loans being cross-secured, right? The cross-securitization agent is not really way to go because sometimes you want to pull out this particular property because it has increased in value. When you pull it out, you cannot pull out because the remaining property need to be revalued by the current lender. And it doesn't, if it doesn't have enough valuation, if it doesn't have enough value, you can get out or you may have to pay the remaining loan balance. So cross-securitization is not a way to go. Now, when you do loan structuring, there are two, there are two factors that you need to consider. The loan purpose, yeah. is it for investment purposes, or is it, is it a, a cost loan, or a company loan, or under personal needs? Now, if it is a trust, you have to remember, if you're borrowing under the trust, there is no negative hearing impact, because that is not under your name. So you know what negative care effect helps you in servicing. But if it's a trust, there is no negative care effect. So you may not be able to borrow. But at the same token, there are other lenders there that say, okay, you borrowed from the, uh, there are liabilities in the trust, but if you borrow borrowing under your personal name, we may not include the liabilities under the trust. So it's a good thing, right? Because your income and liabilities is only based on your personal. So the trust liabilities are not included, but not all of do that. So if there are liabilities under the trust, you're borrowing under your personal name, we may be able to do that, but it has to be, there has to be an accountant letter that says it's self-liquidating, it pays itself. Now we have AZ, Bank, Bankwest would not include the liabilities under the trust. And any, any financial commitments under the company, that also not included as part of your liabilities. Only included if you have to add that the net profit before tax or the depreciation. So financials commitment under the company only included in servicing if we have to add back the net profit, net profit before tax depreciation or superannuation. So loan structuring also involves companies, right? PTY LTVs, if you're borrowing under the company, the same situation as you're, you're borrowing under the trust. So which one would you prefer? Am I going to borrow against? Am I going to borrow under my name or am I going to borrow under the trust? You need to speak to your accountant. Or if you haven't decided yet, let me check it for you how your servicing is. So it is no point of creating a trust and you cannot even borrow. So I get one, I think this week, asked me, can I borrow under the trust? And I said, you can't borrow under the trust because there's no negative hearing effect. And if there's no negative hearing effect, it's nothing there. So I said, but there is an alternative. Guys, remember, if you want to purchase an investment property, you don't have any equity, you don't have any cash, there is an alternative, self-managed super fund. Obviously, that's the elephant in this room, I think, lately. Anywhere you go, self-managed super fund. Now, a lot of people say, do I need 40% deposit? No, for residential loan, you only need 20% deposit. And can it be principal and interest repayments? No, we can also do interest on the repayments. It's any similar to the residential loan. So some money super fund is an alternative way of acquiring investment properties. Now, if you have, say, um, I have one only have 150,000 balance, right? Was able to purchase two properties. But also remember, 
we cannot harvest equity in self-managed super fund. We can refinance for a better interest rate, but we cannot harvest equity. So if you have, normally you have the custodian trust, the self-money super fund is MSF, there are the borrowers is SMSF, and the property is named under the custodian trust, it's also called Bayer Trust, right? So if you want to refinance for a better interest rate, it's only dollar to dollar. So I think if you have self-money super fund, consolidation between partners or eight members of your family, and maybe that's the way to go to acquire investment properties. Now, if you are buying commercial self-money super fund, then the valuation ratio that the bank would probably require 30% deposit. But as I said, Residential investment only requires 20%. Can be interest only repayments. Of course, you can pay principal and interest repayments, but why go there if you won't have this much on your investment uh, on your self and super fund? So loan structuring is very important because I don't want you to buy more than one property. Just one or two. I want you to buy more. Now, to do that. But there's a big I, difference between if you buy one or two or 10 or 20. And, you know. Yeah, but to do that, you need to speak to Zina because we are very, very good at restructuring your loan and moving forward, we know where to bring you to, right? Jonathan Atlee, you agree? <laughs> yeah. So, restructuring your loan is very, very important. Now, as I said to you, there is one called harvesting equity. You know what harvesting equity is. That means you are releasing equity from your current property. Say for example, you don't have any investment property at all, but you have a home that is probably had equity now. Some people would say, oh, I'm not gonna borrow against my house, that's my house. Are you touching that? Hey, you have your choice. If you wanna go there, then let's, you know, let's, let's just use what you have. So, if you don't have any investment properties, but you've got a house worth a million, then borrow 80% of one million, 800,000, you're all 600,000. You have 200,000 to pay for an investment property. No, we have 200,000, you go far. Let me help you with that. <laughs> Yeah, 200,000. If you're going to be invested, ninth and special fee, 200 to 300, you can buy. Now, the good thing about it, your loan is very small, manageable loan. Is that right, Nathan? Of course. <laughs> if you're pulling 50k equity out of a 200 grand property, you're getting 20% of it back, 25% of it back. If you're pulling out 50k equity out of a 600 grand property, you're getting less than 10% back from it. So, yeah, how, how much you need to put towards your next deal, and it's much more manageable, much more attainable. The numbers will stack up. But to structure it alone, right? You say, oh, what am I going to do with this? If you're going to release 200,000, let me structure your loan. So we can honor our provide with your current like 600,000. 200,000 as investment loan. The reason hmm. you have to have a split because it has two different purposes. Remember, loan purpose is very important for taxation, taxation purposes. Now, if I release 200,000 for investment purposes, then that will be the statement, whatever you use of that, that will be the one you're gonna send to your accountant and say, hey, this is tax deductible for me. Now, this is one also very dear to me. I see a lot of people, they say, oh, I have 300,000, why would I borrow money against my house or against my current property? Remember, borrowed money is the only one that is tax deductible. Correct savings, it's not borrowed money, so it's not a tax deductible. So I say, let's save your savings. Borrow money, because it's tax deductible, and if it's tax deductible, that means it's, you know, you get tax concession. So, you're gonna swap it. You say, I will borrow money, because it's tax deductible, I get your savings, I will replace borrowed money from that property and I put that savings against the 100% offset, it's the same effect. 
Yeah, except that you had now a tax deductible amount that you used for purchasing this property. So, where, which one would you be? Using your savings or using the release of your bank? No, okay. You want investment properties, not just your own home. Often, and as you to the Holy Bible, this is true. After you get settlement, you guys ask, when are you going to harvest the equity? I said, holy shit, man. We're just settled. But I didn't say so. So what that means, I have to, I have to dance as fast as I can with you. Now, I said, let me check. Now, we do have... Is it real? Uh, on the day of settlement, you get your little congratulations email from my team. Sometimes I sit there and I pull it over to it's either I'm like, equity, or no one's there, let's get it out, right? <laughs> Bang, let's go. <laughs> so anyway, so you get all these questions. When can I harvest equity? Okay, let me check. No, I have a strategy in place. When you first buy the property, there are the end of day that we say, okay, this is a full valuation required. No, I don't mind full valuation at the onset, right? Purchasing a property require full valuation. First, you, get, you haven't seen the property. Sorry, Nathan, but I have to touch this. You haven't seen the property. So how would you trust Nathan? Is it really a good property? Is it maybe half left in this house? So. How good is that if you have to pay a valuation of 330 or 500? Now, at least someone sold the property in the eye of the valuer. So I would trust the valuer. So I'll put you in the second tier later. Now, if I put you the first man, they will value the property as per the purchase price. Now, you ask me now, when can I harvest the equity? This is the story. This is where the story begins. Let's harvest the equity. Now, the only reason you have the equity if we can do a desktop valuation. So who's very famous for desktop valuation? Your ACC, CPA, the main, the main lenders. So you can hear, CPA can value your property by 15 percent more than ANZ. You've heard it all the time, right? It's always, it's all around TikTok. <laughs> CPA. <laughs> So, so we put you on the uh, second tier lender. Property is valued. The value of the value work it is kind of the same as the purchase price. Now, you want to hire the equity? Let's bring you to the main lender where they can do the desktop valuation. Now, we have a good story. One, he's only young, borrowed one property. Uh, he, we put it to a first man. Settled. He hasn't even paid the first repayments. We revalued the property three weeks later. He harvested 70000 Now, how good is that? And then the, set, the bank says, where is the loan statement? Hasn't had any loan statement. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, there you go. But that is 70000 that we were able to release. Now, we have also properties that, as you can, like, you know, like, how much was it? 195,000 in value, it raised 195,000 within three months. Now, where can you find that? That is Knight and Bird's specialty. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's it, that's what we do. Uh, yeah, that's what we do. So, guys, harvesting equity, as I say, you might need the first deposit comes from your equity of your home or maybe savings. But that's only from the onset. Moving forward, you can use the release of the equity to have the second investment, the third investment, and maybe the fourth. The guy knows it will be the sixth. Yeah? So as long as it comes, you can service, we'll be able to help you. Now, please, care of your expenses as well. I can't help you. <laughs> You need to care of your household expenses because the bank looks at the, the statement and they have this household expenditure measure. Now, you need, regardless, if your expenses are lower than what the 
bank says, the bank used this. So do not underestimate. When I talk to you, what are your expenses? I said, do you have groceries? Oh, I don't buy groceries. <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> have a look at my cabinet drawers. It's empty. <laughs> I ain't buying any groceries. Have a look at my cabinet. There wasn't any. No. But it doesn't matter. We still have to do it. I'm a vegetarian. I only eat cabbage and carrots. It doesn't matter. We still have to have the minimum household expenditure. So credit cards, very important. You can't use the credit card, limit the credit limit. No, the thing that I don't like is Amy's charge card. There is no credit limit. Now, how does the bank value that? Do you have a charge card? Like babies, no credit limit. And mostly, uh, I think self-employed use that. The problem with that is, how does the bank assess the credit limit? They look at the last three months of the expenses. The average of that last three months. And say, oh, I all use it all for business purposes. Then you have to prove that it was really used for business purposes. Now, ain't going through the bloody 12 months of the baby start to identify what are the expenses. I have to be the accountant to say these are used for business expenses. But, you know, charge card, I am not happy with that. <laughs> it just doesn't, it just gives me a lot of work. <laughs> it doesn't. And also, you have, when I look at your taxi, dude, guys, it's not a walk in the park. I'm telling you, you can read me, it says, how's my service seems like? I said, give me time, please. I have five, five of your company that I have to read the financials. There are people that own more than one or two companies. Now, sometimes, I just, I just tell your accountant to say it's not crazy or crazy or whatever it is, we can get away with it. Now, the banks, they're very smart. Sometimes they would say to us, okay, you can get away, you might be able to get away with it. Like for example, expenses on the investment. Now, if you plan to buy, to buy for investment, do not exaggerate your expenses. Because you look at the tax after, for example, Commonwealth Bank, if you have already four investment properties, they would then ask, give us a tax return and we need to check what are the investment expenses. Some of you exaggerate the expenses, right? You know, if you're planning to purchase and using your 2022 tax return, please hold on to the expenses for next year. Can we? Uh, can we do that before you said that? Help you. She's gone. Yeah. Three bonds on the back. Yeah, but expenses is very important. Make sure you curve it. Okay, let's look at now. I would have some money, super fun. No other business that we do. <laughs> and then insurance. This is for building insurance. Please, guys, call us if you want building insurance. We can help you. And they're a good company, Allianz. Now, for uh, car loans, we can do car loans for you. If you are self employed, no need to show the financials. As long as the ABN is two years, for a car, you can go up to 150000 and for a truck, 200000 So we So this is an added product for us that we do money, building insurance, in car loans. That's all for tonight. I would like to hear from you. Make the calls to Zena. Because there's five of us there, or six of us who for that call. Honestly, guys, book the appointment. Thank you, Ryan. I think after the question, the water around like Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> speak with Rose or um, one of the other brokers, you can uh, direct your inquiry through us, uh, the IR team, uh, happy to assist them. Um, so Nathan wants to um, continue the chat. You're ready to go? Yeah. I'm good to go now. So I think we've got like a little bit of me talking, I've got some deals, I might just run straight through it. Yeah, I might put some deals up there, make it interactive and stuff. So just things we've been working on. So um, yeah, look, I always said to everyone that the strategy is to build a recession-proof property portfolio. 
people are like, oh yeah, you know, I want to be recession proof, how's it recession proof? Then you have a good market like we've had, apparently it was going to all crash in 2020, but anyway, you know, they dropped interest rates for nothing and surprise, surprise, it was Russia, Ukraine or China that, um, that made property prices go up. Maybe it was climate change that made property prices go up, but also for the fact that they printed so much money. Fundamentally, that's what caused the market to go up, I guess. And, um, you know, a lot of people in that period of time, they go away from the fundamentals, yeah? And a good market, people are like, oh, I'll, I'll sell off my 200 grand property and buy a property that's a million dollars, all right? And then they buy property for a million dollars and go, well, I know that the one down the street has gone up by 20%, so I'll be able to get it in another year, it'll go up, and everyone buys a hope as a good side of a, a bubble. Right? And um, looking at the fundamentals, when times come like now, when you've got a million dollar property rent for $600 per week, and the interest rate's gone up from you know 2.5% to 7%, it's not really attractive or a, a, a strategy that is sustainable. So. Um, I find it, just thinking about what I was going to talk about today, and I was thinking, 14 years ago, um, I stood in different places. One was, was the Hillside Tavern in the area, in the Hills District. One was in the Castle Hill Golf Club, I think it was, I did one. Uh, one was the Hillside Tavern, so uh, the Hillside the Hills Lodge. And um, it was here at the Hills Lodge one. Yeah, feel me, yeah. So back in the day in the Hills Lodge, I was you know, talking about, I remember that one specifically, I was talking about houses in Mount Druitt. Who was fortunate enough to buy a house in Mount Druitt for about 200 grand? Yeah, a couple of you? I know I bought a thousand of those fuckers, right? <laughs> And it's funny because like people were saying to me in 2009, 2010, 2011, oh Nathan, yeah. And I'm like, look, I'm here in Bella Vista, and if you hop on the thing, there's a new road, it's called the M7, and you just drive down there by seven minutes, you'll end up in Mount Druid. You buy a house from two million to 200 grand, right? One day it's just going to go up through the roof. And people are like, oh, yeah, but it's all, you know, it's this rough and this and that, and that's it. And now, you know, it's a million dollars out of Mount Druid. And, uh, you know, people didn't see the foresight. I remember specifically um, challenging someone on that. And they were talking to me about Mount Druid and then we got up in value. And I asked them, like, you know, how long were you in Sydney for? And they said, oh, I've been here for five years. I'm like, well, what do you think of Birmingham? And you know, down near Parramatta, they're like, oh, it's a lovely area, it's a great area. It's like, when I was a kid, all I remember is that that was like the Mount Druid beforehand, and it's like one and a half million dollars at that point. And, uh, and they're like, oh, yeah, but that's different, that's not Mount Druid. Right? And all the opinions, all the monkeys on their shoulders that were talking about why things couldn't happen in that. And if we fast forward, the fact is, is that uh, I know I've got people who bought in more blues here, if you don't mind putting it over, someone with more blues. Of all properties here in Bort Blues, right? It doesn't matter where they are. They'll pick up properties of block of units in Bort Blues for 600, yeah, in Lodi, uh, 600 grand, you're worth like 1.8, 2 million. I'm just making these numbers up now. But like doubled or tripled over those years, and I'm you know, pushing those numbers high there. Renting for you know $600 a week, $500 a week. Now they're renting for a thousand a week, roughly 800. Yeah, give a little nod there too. Um, but if we look at Mount Druid, you could have bought houses for 150, 200, and these things have gone up to 800 or a million bucks. So you know the strategy was to get the assets. If we're going into a boom. You want to be getting assets, and you want to be getting, would you want to have a million dollars turned into two million, or would you want to have five million turned into ten million? And the, the aim of the game is to have the largest amount of assets. If you've got ten properties, or you've got one property, you put ten lots of rents up instead of one set of rents up. So looking at the market fundamentally 14 years ago when I started the business, looking at the market going back 20 years ago when I bought my first property, um, the fundamentals are still very much similar growth at about 200 grand, 300 grand, those sort of prices. The numbers stack up nice and well there. But if we look at this sort of market, this market that we're in right now, it might feel a bit painful, right? Like we've been challenged with the RBA, we've been challenged with cash rate, we've been ca challenged with the interest rates around the place. One thing that no one ever saw was inflation. They never saw what's happening today with everything else out there in the world. Um, but 
fundamentally, this is very similar to what happened in 2009, 2010, probably 2007. Remember, it was in the market in 2007 in Sydney um, that we had a crash, like a big crash before the GFC. Yeah? If you remember, the crash occurred from 2003 to 2007. My welcome to real estate was buying properties in 2003 as an 18-year-old. And I saw the price of everything crashing, people going broke, interest rates rising like they did just now. Um, but the difference is they weren't increasing at you know four thousand percent on a one million dollar mortgage. They're increasing at like you know um, two hundred percent on a um, mortgage of three hundred grand or whatever it's average rent of every one. So we fast forward from the market. What happened is. Um, Rates crash and rents rose, uh, rents doubled, which is what we're seeing now, which is fantastic. But I think it's a difference. I wish I had a chalkboard or a texter and a whiteboard. Get a texter and draw on the screen and fold it up quickly before the staff can hear. It's all we've done. <laughs> um, uh, talking about now, Drew, it sounds fitting. Drew can be in a little bit. A lot of love for that, Drew. Got a rat's nose for it. Um, but if you got, you know, I'll say this a lot of videos and stuff, and sometimes I was with one of my mates in the room um, the, other, like, the other week about something, and he said, mate, you said this shit to me for like two years, three years, four years, and, and he goes, I think it was a penny that dropped today when you talked, I think it was about a burger or something, or I was paying your house off with a burger or something. And uh, yeah, like, you just kind of throw it, but this is a time, sort of Linda about today as well, where your rents are rising. So yes, you've got a 200 grand mortgage. Your interest rate's gone up by 3% on a 200 grand mortgage. It's gone up by six grand, right? Six grand a year, 120 bucks a week. If you're getting extra 80 bucks, 90 bucks, yes, it's hurting you, expenses, whatever. But the property itself has still got its own hard loans and respiratory system. When the interest rates drop, they drop very fast. They drop much faster than what they went up. Um, and I think that that's with a spread that helps you retire. And I can see a lot of people in this room that have got the assets to get into retirement in the next two years, the next 18 months. Whenever those rate drops happen, the rents happen. You want the rates to start as long as possible because that's giving more fuel for inflation on the rent. So if we had uh, one property or two properties and we had a million dollar mortgage on it and we had $300 or $600 a week rent, it wouldn't really work uh, that far. So uh, I guess, we have the trial and testing strategy. This is a strategy that I've calculated over 20 years. I've formulated to make sure it worked for myself before I suggest it to other people for the last 14 years. It's worked throughout that. It's tried and tested through recession, depression, call it depression, it's, it is pretty depressing the life that, you know, the last few years that we've all had. Um, but all the challenges that can be thrown at it. And we're now in 2023 with rising interest rates, rising rents. And who who here has bought a property in the last year, let's just call it that, yeah? Who has seen that property go up in value in the last year, yeah? Uh, we read the news, like we were saying before here, and it sounds like, oh, it's going through, right? We've got properties which are rising in value. If you bought in Perth for 180 grand last year, it's now 250 grand. Like the market is moving, it's counterfeit. They've gone from 150 to entry price of 200 plus. And you know, you'd expect that you'd see a crash. You'd expect that you'd see pain out there. Why are these things going up? It's because the fundamentals are right when you bought the property. So that it isn't sexy. It's not always sexy. It's not always you know, exciting. It's not we're knocking over properties, building new ones, doing subdivisions, all that. That brings extra layers of risk that isn't really you know, beneficial to you. Having it, I was talking to someone, I'm going to talk to you a little bit later. They bought a nice portfolio, I think it was about like 16 properties, um, 17 properties. These properties were all been up to triple. And um, they want to retire very much. So this person knows who I'm talking about. I'm not even looking in any sort of specific direction because they don't know. Well, they'll know. They'll get a bell But I'm in the process of trying to get them a block of 17 units. Right? Those 17 units bring in 150 grand a year passive income at five years old. That's like 100. 72 grand or something per unit. Super most of them talking about. They look at their, their file today, right? And something like that, like if the steps that you didn't take five, ten years ago get you to where you are today, what steps are you taking in 2023? What opportunities are there? There's always an opportunity out there. 
And I think it's a matter of remaining focused to your goals and understanding you know, what is the bigger picture, what can we do for finance. You know, Rose was here walking around like open beforehand. <laughs> and I don't know why she is, right? Because she is, she's literally walking around. All of you guys have got loans, right? It's like, yeah, you've got 50K for you, you've got 50K for you, right? You would think that we're in this bad time in the world that you wouldn't be able to rip out equity. We're seeing more people build large portfolios. Now, I know, like, just those of you that are in the room that have got these portfolios, I hope you with them. So they've got like 10 properties in a year, 10 properties in two years, 10 properties in three years. And that, you just go to a barbecue, you just empty yourself, right? I'm not going to call out people that talk big personals, right? But you go to a barbecue and you just start a conversation with someone. It's like, oh, yeah, it's a dream. And it's like, turn the sausage into a barbecue. What are you? Oh, I've just bought five from Bullshit, you've got 10 properties, right? You're a fucking wife, right? That's how people would think of you as an investor. But you're doing that because you've got a, a strategy that's, that's allowing you to be able to make that happen. And I think, you know, having the right roadmap, having the right acquisition strategy, having those those those, those right finances around you, very very crucial. Um, there's been some ideas that have dropped tonight that I can see for all of you um, that you could all be doing one extra thing in your life to push yourself forward to the next level. That's doing yourself a super fun, whether it is pushing up your rent. But who's put their rents up this year? Who hasn't put any rents up this year? Charlie, you're all LinkedIn, I guess. <laughs> um, there's so many times I'm having chats, um, like the guy I spoke to with Sharon and sent the text to her beforehand, that I'm just looking at everyone's portfolios. I'm like, you've got an extra 100 bucks there, right? I'm literally every month signing off on the rent increase when it comes to like Queensland, for example. I want to go through all and, and pull apart everyone's portfolio. Some of your portfolios I've seen an extra 700 bucks a week, an extra 1,000 bucks a week. Who's had a, if you don't mind putting your hand up, like if someone's had, who's had 500 bucks a week rent increase this year? Anyone? And there's two, three, holes, yeah? Yeah, few shaking hands, close. Yeah, who's had a thousand? Anyone want to put their hand up for a thousand? I don't know, I'll keep it there. Yeah, we've got a thousand, there we go. Thanks, Steve. I feel like an auction here now. This is what I've had a thousand. That's really what's happening out there, right? Think about it this way, you go to your job. It's a thousand fucking bucks a week, right? It's 50 k a year. I thought it was a job all I thought about. Oh, wow, I'm going to do a year one day. Fucking uh, party, whatever. 50 k Like, imagine going to your job and you go, oh, you know, inflation's going up by 7% like the say at the LBA. Uh, can I please have a 2% increase? Oh, well, you know, maybe you sell us an extra drop of your blood and, you know, do things that you want to do. And we'll give you an extra $1,000 this year, right? The ability with having these assets, you've got the choice to write your own tickets, right? You've got the chance to write yourself your own plan for the future. And um, you know, I think looking back, like our strategy is fucking awesome. No one else out there is doing it. And, you know, there's very little people, as Wayne said beforehand. I didn't even know what Wayne was going to talk about tonight. I saw him, you know. I would leave it because I'm sure he's going to pull out a game for people. He's going to do the game. Oh. You know? Yeah. Can I say what you did earlier? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned my fucking rat snail before, right? <laughs> I'm like, why? You get a rule of measure. I'm like, what? Can I do a measure? I don't know. There's a rat snail. Yeah. <laughs> um, I forget what I was going with that. Yes, I didn't know exactly what's going to be talked about tonight, but looking at. It happens to me sometimes. Too many stories in my head. Yeah. Um, I've had rental increases. I had some little notes to refer back to, but I'll think back to it. Um, yeah, I don't know what this is. Um, but I think the big thing, the, you know, the reason why there's so much success in this room is, is understanding the beast that is in front of us, right? We've all got our goals and all that. The property is just a vehicle. Most people out there when talk to them, they're thinking, okay, property is a destination. The property is going to get us to where we want to be. It's like, well, the property is a destination. Sometimes I speak to people and they're like, and the thing I love about it coming is like, ask, ask all of you, who did I ask when I spoke to you the first time, what's your goal? Yeah, what's the end goal? Ask you all the same questions. We want to hear what is it that we're trying to achieve. A 
lot of the time I speak to people, you might be looking at yourself, and they say, oh, I just want to get three properties. It's like, okay, cool, you want to get three properties, I get it, right? But what are the properties going to do? Do you want 100 grand a year? Do you want 50 grand a year? What is that sort of goal? And then working back from there, the property is just a vehicle. The whole system is designed, right? Like it's much deeper than what we think it is. Um, the whole system is designed around banking and creating more currency out there for us to keep expanding, to keep making money. But when you realise that it's not the property game, the property is just a vehicle, it's a banker's game, that's when the whole paradigm shifts. Most people are quite so focused on, I must buy a property, I can have a granny flat too, I can do this, I can do that, I can do the next thing. But the reality is, if you just want to get the most amount of capital, the most amount of assets that you can obtain, and ride it through inflation. We're in a high inflationary environment. I see people now, and they're selling properties. Well, how the fuck would you sell a property if you're gonna see inflation? Everything is going up, right? Everything's going up so great. Um, I get it, it's cost policy and all those sorts of things do come into the matter. But understanding the paradox, it's not just a, you know, it's just a property game, it's a finance game. I think that's where a lot of you guys have had great success in understanding them and overcoming that. So congratulations for everyone on that front. Um, as for opportunities that are out there, um, you know, people are always, uh, we've had, recently we've had ad, we've never had advertising for free, you go on TV, a lot of you people, have you ever me on TV or something? No? No one's seen me on TV? Have you ever seen me on TV over the years? But now there's no going on TV, I can't do it, right? I can't sit there and go, oh, look at this guy, he's got two and two things, so I just, it's in the soul. But um, we put on some ads, right? We put on some ads, and I see like people commenting on like Facebook pages and like, Facebook posts and stuff. I'm like, you guys are the biggest scammers in the world. <laughs> you can't see them on our pages, right? There's no fucking way you can buy a property for 200, right? And that's the mindset of people out there. They don't understand. They can't see it. They can't picture it. Just because, and that's fine. We need tenants as well, right? So that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Perpetual tenants, it's like those politicians, they've never owned anything apart from yeah, they've never owned the properties. But and half the room I would imagine would be renting as well, right? But you're doing something, you're getting other people to pay you for your lifestyle, and that's the crucial thing. So yeah, a lot of people don't realise that you can still buy properties for 200 grand. I was talking about buying properties, you know, four people years ago in Mount Druid. I was talking about buying properties for $8,500 in the back of the Hempsey, right? You don't want to go there, I swear, right? You get to the bash That's why the rats and all the rats and all the rats and all the rats and all the rats. Rough, rough as guts. Um, but you know, people can't fathom that. And time comes and times go, and you sit back, and most people will be like, I wish I did that. I wish I could go and do this. I should have done this. I should have done that. But now time is passing that way. For the greatest opportunity, and that's inflation. Now, properties, I would sit here and say, I'm the best buyer's agent in the world, which probably am. But, <laughs> um, but it's not the property. It's that you've got the ability to buy the assets. The reason why you've got the ability to buy the assets is because you've got the right assets. You've got the low market value, you've got the right financing to support those assets. So, so it's a few steps that have got you there. And those assets have gone up in, in value because of inflation. The properties, you know, everything's gone up in value. You, you, buy, you buy a property for 100 grand, it turns to 200 grand, your car goes up from 100 grand to 200 grand. You, you can't buy anything else in the system, but with you being able to leverage and build out that strategy is the, the crucial part. And we're now blessed with the opportunity of inflation. Uh, we're blessed with the opportunity of inflation, which will hurt us as well in all that of all that expenses to go up. Our bed here is probably much higher than what it was back five years ago, our last one here. Uh, we go pay for petrol, food, everything's going up, so it's hurting us. But if you've got debt and you've got assets, so if assets are getting pushed up with inflation, the rent is getting pushed up with inflation, and the debt is becoming irrelevant and easier and easier to pay off. Um, I remember back in the early days where I was running loans for me, and I thought I was going to go bankrupt and send a loan of 200 grand or something, right? <laughs> 200 grand, people are getting car loans for 100 grand or 50 grand and stuff like that now. It's much easier. The asset's worth 2 million or a million, and you've got a 100 grand loan, it's easy to pay it out. But um, you know, I'm seeing a lot of people that are taking action, like you guys in the room and thousands of other investors, 
that you know, how to get that action, but they're getting there much faster because you've got a system that you're working towards. You've got you know, momentum, you've got a strategy, and you've got a market that's moving in the right direction. And inflation is the biggest friend of it. And uh, your rents will be going up if it wasn't for inflation. You know, Purchase prices and the value that we know that's awesome for that. Um, yeah, so that's what I wanted to talk about. Some of the things I've been buying, I noticed all the wool banner there, right? Last time we caught up, I didn't have the Virtual Tall Group like five years ago. And I saw that we'd have problems in the future. I started buying acres and acres of land in the Hills District that were like 200,000 square meters of land. Those things kill me when it comes to tax, right? They kill me when it comes to land tax, right? And, but I know one day I'm going to develop it and it's going to be worth lots of money and all that. But I realized that I need to get more cash flow. So in my journey, I started, you know, just like that person I was talking about before, they bought 10, 15, 20, 20, 50 and now we're looking to buy more to units so they can retire. We're playing Monopoly, right? If you don't add a Monopoly, then Monopoly games will read anyway. It's a program that's to believe that cash is real and all that stuff. They're leaving out the fact of printing it or making it. Sorry? It's yeah, true. So everyone should be learning how to play Monopoly. Um, if you've got that foundation portfolio, there's people here that we said before, and there's a second generation of investor. There's people here that have bought their principal place of residence. I can see someone in the back of the room that has used their properties they bought in the Gold Coast. I remember when we were buying the Gold Coast. bought in the Gold Coast. He's here, right? Years ago, we'd be like, oh, the Gold Coast and buy there, and we'll never go off. And it's tripled, right? Um, so there's people in the room that have got those properties and they're going, okay, well now I can sell them off. I can pull out the equity, use that equity to go and buy my dream house. There's people in this room that live in acreages, in the Hills District, that have used their foundation portfolio to get them there. Um, you know, we'll pull some, some of you guys up and talk about some things later. Well, those ones are pretty very of course. Um, but yeah, like the Birch Hotel Group, which is what the monthly door price lady you're going to talk about, I started that because I was like, hey, hang on a second, there was an opportunity in the market. Corona came and there was people that couldn't sell their motels. Um, no one would lend money. Right? Everyone was laughing at it, this piece of shit and buy it. Why do I can buy a motel cheaper than a house? Right? So I saw the opportunity there, opportunity for cash flow. And I look at all the markets, just what I saw 14 years ago in Mount Druid, right? When I was talking to everyone about it, you can laugh at it. Just like I saw 20 years ago, buying the first property out of Mount Druid. Just as I saw 12 years ago, buying in the Gold Coast for the first time. I could have sat there and be sitting in the back of um, you know, the Gold Coast going, I'm too scared these things will move forward in half the five years, 10 years prior. But I saw opportunity. And if we're looking at the macroeconomics today in the markets, I'll be looking at coal, right? Who cares about coal being pissed on out there, right? It's, um, everyone hates it, but now they're putting hydrogen out there, and there's the boom, there's naval bases going out there, there's all these different things that are happening in the markets, and then you look at the macroeconomics, it's saying, okay, well, what is going to drive that next market to go from 200 grand to 400 grand? How quickly will it happen? You know, what are the, the odds that are stacked towards, what are the odds that are stacked against it? and what sort of decisions can we make? And there's lots of you here today. I was going to randomly ask another question. <laughs> Who's had a property that they think's doubled in the last year or two? Yeah, if you want to your hands up, yeah. A lot of you don't even know that these properties double speed. I'm like, oh, you're trying to get double, really, is it? Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's like, the reason why did they double it? If you go look at statistical data and you look at the house in Sydney, a house in Sydney has gone from 1 million to 1.2 million or something, and it's so highly negative cash flow that you've got a property of 150 that's doubled to 300, and it's got positive cash flow. So not everything's correlated. Your, your, your growth isn't guaranteed, your cash flow isn't guaranteed, but then put a lot more of the odds back to your decision that you're making and removing the risk odds from your position. So, um, on that note, I think I've got just ran a couple of deals that I'm going to talk about. Um, these are just deals that are available at the moment, anyone? If you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> I did a bulk deal today. They're going, like, they're going so fast. Last week, we lost over 30 deals where we bought them, secured them, and you know, people had come in and, uh, and, 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 and paid more from outside of us. Bulk deal, I sent it to a few of you in the room today. Um, I have a cheap way, love. Uh, 300 grand. 10 years ago, the seller paid 495 for the thing. It's only 10 years old. 450 a week rent, 8% yield. 
depreciation on it, we quite a lot here. And, uh, and uh, you can't build the thing for 300 grand. Sydney, uh, these things are very hard to get now. 15 came from the CBD, two bedroom property, 355, 420 is comparable, we're battling them up at that. Some of you in the room we need to help your equity. Um, 480 bucks a week. These things are ready for 280 a year ago. I reckon it would be 550, but anyway, Chris will you know, talk otherwise. But I like pushing those rents up, and I don't hear all the calls from the tenants going, you put my fucking rent up. <laughs> That's what Blink has to do with it, right? <laughs> uh, a unit in Queensland, got this one today, 245. There's another one in the same complex that sale at 308. Um, 420 bucks a week, 9% rent a year. And there's all the interest rates, interest rates, all, you know, these things are going that too. Perth, 260k CBD, right in the city, 260k, 300k, we're re them up. Um, uh, rent's on, getting 420. Um, Sharon, what would a two bedroom unit in Perth City, like those suburbs that you've been seeing and sent through to you, roughly rent out for? 420 is line on, or? Uh, so it's about 450 bucks a week, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's about 450, 450. I'm getting surprised. Like, uh, say, who's had a property where I've told you the rent and I've under quoted you on it? It's rent for a, a lot more than what I put in the cash flow sheet. Yeah. I don't help with it. Up. She always sends me like, man, the little bit of. But thanks, Mel. I get excited when I see those emails from you. Um, next one is uh, 90k. Who's got a car that's worth more than 90k? Who's got a car that's worth more than 90k? Fuck me, dude. Right, guys. What's a new Ford like? I bought a Ford Raptor, right, for 72, 74 grand. You bought a unit for 60 grand, right? For the same car, right? But I bought a unit the car for 74 grand. I sold it for 72. And I thought, yeah, great, I got the money back. Geez, like the engine light was flashing when I sold the fucking thing. That's just having a day. So I looked on Facebook Marketplace, now selling for 90 grand for a second hand Ford Raptor. Can I fucking you? Or you can buy you the <laughs> Give me like 40% yield. Oh, they're out there. Um, uh, just another one. I can say all the numbers, but you can see the picture. Let's go. Here's another one. There we go. Jeep Lake's there. Wait, go back one. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. <laughs> 236 grand for two. Two Jeep Lakes, right? Two. My double guard. And uh, 560 per week rent. This is actual, right? I don't know if the person's in the room. Coffee in the room. No, no, not in the room. I didn't think she was in the room. She's not. She's not in the room. Two hundred ninety grand in Sydney, right? This client bought the property for two ninety, repaid it for five twenty within like two months, right? And it's ready for three forty a week. Sounds sounds like pessimistic, like three forty or two ninety, right? Oh, you know, could have got the better rent refer, could you imagine? But yeah, anyway. Oh, moving on to um, Brisbane CBD. This one here um, is actually one of our team members, right? Pat. Everyone knows Pat. Knows Pat. Yeah, no, Pat. Cool. He's not here today. He's not old though. So I thought he was huh? it. He's a drummer. He's a drummer. He's in a high school bit, no. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he bought a property in Brisbane. So I send deals to you guys, you guys say yes, no. You know, I don't want to buy them, too scared, whatever. Sometimes the people are like, oh, that fits what I need. We just buy the same thing. So this thing here, 420 grand, probably the most expensive one that's up there. Um, Rebate it straight away for 630k. Rent on it, I think it's around 560 a week. That's, I think, a bit light on. Um, and he came to us the other day, I think this is lower, but I knew it was eight something, I think it was eight forty, eight twenty. He's got a real estate agent trying to get him to sell it because we're buying it for another one in the same complex. He only bought this thing a year ago. So anyway. Real. Uh, this one here, we had on the slide beforehand that that property was in there, the video, and it said 200 grand, it was actually 205. This guy started with 40 grand, and um, he got a 90%, which I, I reckon 97% of you, 98% of you in the room would be at a 80% land um, and uh, on your properties. This guy here, first time buyer, um, only had 40 grand, he's a uni grad student, and uh, he bought his first property in March this year. 205. It's actually a bulk deal of four that we bought. Um, 
Anyone bought it in Noble Street, Mackay? No? no? It was a block of four. There's a lot of you supporting it, four of you support. Um, we repaid it straight away for 269 Pulled out his equity, bought himself his second property in Perth. That's about to settle. We're going to go back and pull out the equity and this guy is a student in uni to a uni grad student. Rent's a fourth when he went. Don't know. Perth CP, 295, 420. Next one. Queensland. Yes, this one here. This was a bulk deal of 10 properties. Um, it's actually a town bill. And 152k is the purchase price. Uh, settled, when would it have settled? The, uh, March this year, settled. Um, Rebanged it straight away. You go above, you're doing something like this. This is right, Friday night, Saturday. Aaron barbecue, you have a beer, you have a drug, you think the miss it, don't you? 152, you can buy a copy for 150k. You rent it for 300, you can't rent it for 300 bucks. I bring it for 250. You're a liar. Get out of here, right? Oh, I'm true. I pulled out the effort and bought two more. <laughs> true story. And uh, yeah, that's that's it. You can you can. People think that they can't do anything at the moment. If you have properties, you're feeling stuck. Like go to the bank and just say, hey, push my fucking rent up. Give me more money. I'm hungry. Not the case. Why it increases, right? I got a speeding ticket. I didn't really. I got a speeding ticket. I had a bad day. Hey, please, can you put up a rent? Make it good. Yeah, sure. Ten bucks a week, five hundred bucks a year. Great. That pays the speeding ticket. It pays it in the um, It's something you can be doing. You've got a super fund. Oh, these companies, they're taking my money. They're out having a big party. It's invested into the stock market. Don't know what's happening with it. It's a super fund. Do something to improve your position. Um, are we having
And then 2000 delay on board this thing, I never even saw it. Right? And uh, it was 36 units in the Blue Mountains, 36 motor room. And um, I thought if I just ran it out to the housing commission, um, you get 200 bucks a week, 1.665, and no one can get a loan. So you couldn't run it as a business and get a loan, and you couldn't buy it as a hotel for commercial property, you had to buy cash pretty much. So I went and refinanced my portfolio, put out 200 a year, 200 there, 200 there, and then bought it cash under the outright. I ran it out of the house commission. That's what you say, all right. Um, <laughs> for my whole five years, I was renting out for 200 bucks a week, 36 rooms, about eight grand a week, and uh, 400 grand a year, so great return. And then like, all these people saw me the newspaper, they like, you better drop our rent, we're gonna go to council. Council told me I'll have to come out. All these uh, drums and stuff went on in there. And then um, that was it, right? And it was a nightmare for property. Well, I'm selling it. I'm selling it really well, right? And then uh, a few years ago, I got into the motel business, started buying motels, and I was like, hang on a second, if I'm going to buy these motels, I better run like fucking corporate, right? I've got like hundreds of staff, and we've got like HR, accounting, marketing, all that. So I was like, if you've got a mum and dad that can run their business without a website and all that, free stuff with the motels. And then, um, I was going to sell this thing. I actually had an NDIS and I was going to like, redo it. I was like, hey, I'm going to sell my motels. I'm going to be trouble. I'm going to tell you, I've been to the rent. I've conducted my biggest renovation, right? So if you go to the Blue Mountains, do you stay in the Blue Mountains? Do you stay in the Blue Mountains? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Is it Wentworth Falls? Wentworth Falls? He's called the Red Sleazy for the local, called the Red Sleazy. And um, yeah, I gutted it two years ago. And in the Blue Mountains, who stayed at any luxury motel in the Blue Mountains? They're all old motels, would you say, yeah? They're all um, you know, very historical. And I gutted this thing, eh? like everything, the roof gone, uh, everything. The windows, the balustrades, everything. It's the biggest rent I like, literally building a whole brand new motel there. And um, it is you know, the, the coolest way to the Blue Mountains. There's one called the Kaya. Does anyone know the Kaya? You've heard of it? Like it's, it's very popular. We've got influencers and stuff on all the time. Um, this motel will be better than that. Uh, so it's going to be pinto. And um, I was hoping it would be finished by then last year. But uh, it will be finished. I'm, I'm there every second day. You know, trades, meeting them, do this, do that. I'm going to be out there all day tomorrow. And uh, that thing's going to be an epic motel. It's going to be like, whenever you wish to come along, we'll have a green open for you all the time. But this thing here is, uh, I expect from the revenue by building it out as a business that that property that was such a bad thing back in the day, like it was great, then it turned bad, then it turned good. It should be bringing in 300 bucks a night, on a good night, 500 bucks, bad night, say 200, say average 300, 36 rooms, so whatever that equals out, I've calculated it means at times. I'll put a very good calculator in my brain, but um, it's about 10 grand a day, uh, 60%. Uh, occupancy rate, 365 days a year, to bring like two and a half, three more profit net per year from that property, right? But once again, within those two the, 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 the decisions 20 years ago, I wouldn't be able to do that. And that's what we've got this all thing to look like. It's good. It's, I literally have ripped out a restaurant and there's some trees that's appearing. So I tell you, a couple of trees that are getting trimmed, they're very bad, they, they can go. Did trim. <laughs> trim, right? No, the tree guys have done their thing and they're very not good trees. And um, <laughs> there's going to be a view all over the Jamison Valley. So literally, I'm taking the whole wall, all the walls out of a restaurant, and it's just like a big observatory thing all over the valley of Blue Mountain. So it's pretty cool. So. Yeah, so that's how uh, I didn't paint it so great at the start, but it's, it's like, it's going to be awesome. So. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Yeah, we go there, we go this weekend, the big party will supply a few cases of beer, chip rockers, we've got chip rockers and payers, we'll knock me out tomorrow, it's great. Right. <laughs> so, thanks, thank you. Congratulations, man. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Alright, so this is a, a bit of a, a client chat with Nathan. Thank you. Um, I think the first couple... Dominique and Danielle. Danielle? Oh, just Danielle. 
There we are. There. Right there. there we are. <laughs> Lucky to have them on home. And uh, their uh, investor relations rep is Hannah. And Peter is the zinger broker. So would you like to come up, Peter? Yeah. Yeah. So do we hear those little mic? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 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 So I just got some random questions. Now I'm going to keep you just share what you feel comfortable sharing, don't you? Yeah. The bowl draw, you would got this, and we've got the other, and all that. So when did you start investing with us? When did we have a chance? I still remember our first chat. I remember all that first chat. <laughs> yeah. 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 Cool. And um, what made you decide that you wanted to A use this or B get in the property listing, I guess is the legal question. So, um, we've always sort of been interested in um, property investing. We've flipped a couple of houses um, a few years ago now, and um, I've always sort of kept an eye on you and what you've been doing for being invested, and um, just thought um, because we run our own building company and, and our own business, and um, we're very busy people, so we just thought that you know, we're better off just following a system that's, that's tried and tested, and um, and uh, you guys seem to run a really well oiled machine, like I say, and um, make it a good to mind you. And um, yeah, we're really glad we did. One of our properties we just bought on that place, the one that took like eight months. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. The one that I still don't bring our last. Okay. So, uh, they're not going there, okay. <laughs> That's so good. Okay, okay, okay. 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 great. Yeah. There's so much happening there, right? There's yeah. so much happening there, but it's really good. Um, so what would be some of like the highlights, the challenges? Like obviously that's a good challenge it's taken forever to get us to where we are today. It's not always you know, still sailing, but that's just one deal that's taken forever and we're still pushing to get it across the line. What are some of the highlights of like the properties? Like have you had like a cool story that you know, your rent's gone crazy or you renamed it or something? Um, Passive income, really, um, and equity, obviously. And um, but yeah, look, I mean, initially I think it was 10, but yeah, you know, you know, it's, it's oh, there's a limit with you guys, really. So I thought it was impossible to get 10. Um, but for me, when I first started and you get there, it's like, fuck, 10, is that it? I want more, why don't you give me more? Yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's a golden journey. Yeah. How do you think, like, in the last year, things have changed for you to, like, has it been a mindset shift in the last year? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we're, we're sort of getting really aggressive about our approach with yeah. buying property. I think it's a good time to be yeah. getting into property. Yeah. Um, I listen to a lot of um, Kiyosaki podcasts, and uh, yeah. you know, they're saying property is a good place to, to put your money in this climate. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're very uh, bullish about property. Cool. So, and, and before now, because you were building, like, what was your story before coming to us? Like, so we're building all fire. Who came in as a you buying and selling beforehand? Or was this the first one that you bought, or what's the backstory? Um, we bought a, a block of land up in Ballina in 2015 and built, built a house up there. Um, and then we thought maybe we could start a new life up there, and, um, and then decided it was just way too slow paced and we wanted to come back to Sydney and, okay. and earn better money and, and, and build, build a portfolio. So, uh, we sold that property and bought our first house in Sydney and then had dramas with the business and had to bail out the business and sell our, our home. Um, and yeah, we've just been rebuilding it since then. We've just sort of come forward with you guys and, yeah. and we're really yeah, quite grateful for that and glad we did. Yeah. How would it be part of your journey? So thank you for contrasting. So, yeah. 
Um, any feedback from the team? Like, what are your thoughts? Any questions that you have for these guys? I'm just really proud of these fans because with investing, as I'm sure everyone will know, there's lots of challenges, lots of schools that come our way, and it's really the mindset that kind of keeps you on the track, and these guys are just really committed to the goals, and they're such a good crowd. Guys are one of my favorite clients. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I
has to support now, which is which is important. Um, so I don't know what you feel comfortable sharing that, but like your thought, like your, your properties, like what would be your favourite property? Uh, I think the favourite one was probably the one you got from me at early heads there, which is kind of probably sticks out to be my favourite. Why? I think you presented it to me three fifty maybe, I think. I was like, yeah, that's that's good and then I accepted it and week or two later you're like right, right, sent me an email, put it on ten grand of it. Like better so <laughs> and um, yeah, no, that probably is good. Also good now. Probably. Um, you know? I think I've, I've seen others in that area like 800. <laughs> when you buy that? That's correct or not? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, when, when did you buy it? Uh, probably about yeah, somewhere around that time, yeah. 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 yeah, cool. Um, I remember like sometimes having a chat with you and you're like a bit unsure of doing a deal. Like people might be here, like your portfolio is fucking mad, right? It's, I'm not going into money. Like, if you want to talk about numbers and stuff, you're not pressured to either. But like I know when you're buying, you're like, oh yeah, should I buy this one? And like you get nervous. And it's normal, right? Doesn't matter you buy one or ten or you know, wherever you're at, like you, you will have that monthly on your shoulder, you should not be doing this. Um so what sort of things do you think going through? Let's say if you looked at that property, I think that one you would have said, yeah, let's go ahead with it. Some of them are like, oh, I should have done it. Yeah. And what were some of the fears that you had? And what did that turn out to eventually to be? Uh, I think just me, just naturally the way I am. I just thought I was everything. Um, always have. And I was going to make sure I do my own research as well. And not that I ever backed out anything, but always just double check everything. And, um, yeah, like, oh, Nathan's never done the wrong work, never let me everything he's offered been unreal so far, so, yeah. 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 One of the funny, there's actually a really funny story to this, right? I'm not saying we work or anything, like, you know where you work, right? It's a big, big company. There's someone from his work, he's a client as well, right? You know, you know who they are. And they bought some property truck. Bing, right? Big, big, dirty on big income, right? And it's like, you're on a good income, but like some people that like can be, they can have a lot more, like, and people go, oh, well, I need to do this to get this, I need that to get that. Persons at like 15 to 20% of where you're at, net worth, like property acquisition. And it's like, and they feel stuck, like the decisions they got, they couldn't service that well, they were stuck, they couldn't make moves forward. And I just remembered having that conversation, I was like, wow, like Brett's position, like you've like, your assets are like far superior than like, the people in the mahogany desk in the business, right, where you work. And it's like, uh, it's just really cool. Like sometimes you may not understand how great that position are, new position, I just I get a lot of uh, you know, happiness inside when I think about just maybe share some of the numbers. Like, so you've got Pure Road, how do you qualify? Yeah, I think we paid... Um, 260 or something. 260, I think, for that one, yeah. yeah. And, um, What's it worth now? Uh, now, I think it's... We revalued it. Yeah. No, there's nothing... If you go on realestate.com right now, guys, last time I checked my home, it'd be like 550. Yeah, yeah. maybe. So it's like double the bit. Building heads, doubles the bit. Yep, so heads, um, there's botany. Botany? Yeah. I thought they were just buy shit all botany. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> what did you pay for botany? Uh, that was roughly uh, four, four something. Four something, right? Two bedroom and one bedroom. Yeah. Two bedroom. Two bedroom, maybe yeah. four fifty or something. Yeah. And um, you bring that pretty quickly, it's like 650 or something, yeah? Uh, yeah, I think it's quite a bit, yeah, that's good. I know we don't, the first round, full deck on the, um, was like, yeah, that's not something we got out of the kitchen. I was quite surprised when the next round, yeah. So I was, I was actually driving at Sydney, I had to fly to Sydney. I'm thinking about the process. You got the wrong blue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's always quite nice to hear when you're working. 
kind of today too. Big kind of juicy comments in the way of doing this and that. Yeah, that's good, that's good. So this is just like a little snapshot. And this is like, you bought your first one in 2020 or 21, you said, yeah? Uh, the original, I bought my first one. Uh, oh, with us, like, uh, uh, you the first. Yeah. yeah, so with you guys. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was 2019. Yeah, because I think I came on board on 2019 or something like that. Yeah, yeah cool. Yeah. So, uh, four years thereabouts, um, and cool portfolio. You had one before you came to us, like some of might be watching, uh, you know, this guy might have had property with heaps of equity or anything like that. It was just one property. No, it was just a normal property, just in a regional town around where I am. And, yeah. Um, yeah, sort of use that one to step into the next one and then yeah. from there just build up the video and yeah. you know, I think we're up to the name or something. Yeah, there you go. That's fucking awesome, aren't you? <laughs> and has there been any times that have been like stressful for you or? Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's been times that... Yeah. Yeah, for you? Yeah. More of some thing where it's Absolutely, it's nice, but it's all worth it, man. <laughs> what sort of things? What sort of bring up people? What sort of things like? Just questioning things and like, yeah, get headaches, just thinking and over, like I'm overthinker, just naturally yeah. overthinker, but. Um, do the right decision. Do yeah. Got myself into too much. Yeah. Debt. That's. Well, I don't really think that yeah, that doesn't matter. Right. It's more just the pressure, the time frames. Like I know Stephen probably know as well. But, oh, I need to try and get an extension. Today she's trying to say, oh, next to Stephen can get an extension. I don't know. But, yeah, it's stressful at the time, right? Yeah. But to get an extension, but it's like you hear like the stress that you have on the day. It's like it's over. Like when the stress is done, it's gone. It's not like something's gonna carry with you forever as well. Yeah, that's it. I think it's good. Like you got a team around you, sort of thing. So there's always something someone to talk about. Like I'm not doing it on my own. So yeah, there's always someone you can call up and they'll put this problem, how do we get out of it, so. Yeah, yeah. sometimes I, I speak to you guys and I feel like I'm a counsellor, you know, it's like, who's your problem? <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, we'll just jump off the rents. It's always comes down to pushing those rents up as hard as we can, but uh, what happened to your rents? We need an older actually personal review it. So um, can someone make a note? If he's not here, so Aaron, if you can just make a little note for, you know, I want to have a review of your whole portfolio just to push those ranks up. So I reckon, just in your portfolio, I reckon I'm pushing 500 bucks a week, like literally. That's the real fucking lucky door prize. I'm pushing that around, because that's like every week. Just paying everything. So, yeah. Yeah. Good. Any tips for anyone? Um, I think if you're someone like me that always questions everything, and, I struggle with trust sometimes, or just they trust them. Like, yeah. I'll come back and uh, yes, man, great day for me so far. Awesome, great day. Your story, like, I know it. We know what we talk about. You know your position, I know your position. I'm really proud of you. Really proud of you. Like, I like seeing people do good things and they, you know, they get ahead of So, yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks, man. I love you. Thank you. Uh, our final client is in the front row, Jason and Kate. Uh, Jason, you want to pop up? Thanks for agreeing to this. So I, uh, I'm the uh, IR rep, Jason. So um, Jason first contacted us. Back in and who's your broker, Jen? Ah, oh, Jen. Sorry, Jen. Jen, come up. Yeah, well, Jen. We're getting a good range of like brokers and you know, the so, IR stuff. Yeah, Jen was support, and then she yeah. moved up to, to be a broker. Yeah. Time. So um, I think Jason contacted us 2021 initially. No, 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 no. Jason. Oh, well, I only started in yeah. 2020. Jason turned up to a housing commission firehouse that some kids had blown up with a fucking pie bomb. <laughs> and now I drew it. About 2010 ish. 
back in the day, I used to be like, being investing was going to be an education business, right? I started making videos and say, hey guys, check out what I've just bought. What do you think of it? They were like, how the fuck did you buy a house for eight grand? How did you buy a house for 50 grand? Like, Western Sydney, 150 grand, whatever. And they would do like a little seminar. I don't know. It was like a bit like a little seminar. It was like 50 bucks or something that came out and chat with me. And like, yeah, 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 come out and have a little bit of our house. And yeah, watch me fix it for 10 grand. <laughs> <laughs> You're like plastering over, you know, burnt timbers and things. <laughs> <laughs> but it all, it all came up good. And that's why I don't have a daughter's license today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, cool. So it goes way back, eh? Hey? And uh, uh, so that that was awesome. I right? met you, and um, you were like 28, something like that. Yeah. Um, you had huge problems. Yeah. And um, you were just so full of energy and passion for the problem. Yeah. And that just that actually united me back then. It's just yeah. like, oh, crap, this is a great world. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then I just stuffed around for like 10 minutes and um, yeah. gave you guys a call. I think I gave you guys a call. Just waiting. Yeah, just waiting. Yeah, I just started the business. I couldn't get finance. I couldn't get finance. Uh, we spoke before because I remember I was renovating one of my properties out of Pit Town in maybe 2019. We had a, just a chat in 2019 and we were like, yeah, this is cool. And you told me about we met out of the problem. I think Steve, Steve was at that same reno. You guys would have been in the same room fucking 12 years ago or something, eh? Hey? Burnout shell, yeah. <laughs> um, small world. Um, and yeah, we, we, there's a few times that we tried to get started, but you couldn't do something at the right time. But, yeah, but we've had the right time recently. Yeah? Yes, yeah, so I think I finally um, I had a few years running my current business. And then I contacted you again to see if we get finance. Yeah. And, um, and Rose and Genevieve both their magic and, and off we went. And um, it, yeah, it's just been awesome since then. And it's <coughs> not just um, the finance side of their business, it's like now I've dipped my toe in everything. So um, we've worked with Stephen at Zenith and he's been awesome competing. Yeah. And I've uh, spoken to Ruman and he's helping me with this uh, super now. He's got all this money now super up. He's just going backwards. Yeah. And now we're gonna take advantage of that. So it just everyone has been so yeah, cool. Cool. And um like you had this a couple of problems without going into your portfolio you talk about actually what about I was not gonna uh, lead you into that. So, uh, so we're aware. Um, but you had some properties beforehand that were different to what you bought, yeah? Yes. How do you think the properties you bought beforehand are different to the ones now? How would they help you? Like they've done well because of putting equity and stuff like that. But if, if we had a hop in the DeLorean and drove back to your model in 2010 and you changed things differently, how do you think these new type of properties and different strategy has changed to help you? Like, I mean, that's the big um, thing that I've realised. Yeah. I would love that to be right now. Because yeah. um, had I taken this strategy that you follow, yeah. that I'm following you now, I'm Donald Trump or something like that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, just a better amount of time, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, because <laughs> I kind of, I saw what Nathan was doing and I thought, well, I reckon I could probably do this myself. Yeah. And I ended up buying um, only a few expensive properties. Yeah. And I used all my income in that. Uh, they were low yield, really. Yeah. And, um, and obviously, you weren't going to velocity. Yeah. And I'd, yeah, I would have rather have done what I'm doing now. Yeah. I tried to buy more property. And um, I'm still very happy. Yeah, we're using all that equity, yeah. but it could be a different story. Yeah. And it's, it, 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 what you've got is done, so it's, it's, it's like you have a vehicle that's got you to a certain distance, but you can't, you know, you float into Sydney Airport, you can't, you know, get Sydney Air, the airplane to get you to Castle Hill, you need to hop on a taxi or Uber or whatever to get you to that other part of the destination. So it's changing vehicles along the way to get to the destination. So, yeah. But, but now we're taking advantage of it. 
out in the sky. Okay, and your speed of it, and the, you know, the ability for us to be able to do it if it wasn't for finance, you'd be stuck still. So it's getting the finance right to push forward, and, and it's like, okay, we've, we've taken another 10 steps here. It's like, okay, well, what else can we do now? And it's like, it's super fun, it's like, cool. Like, you, know, you said something very, very important there that I don't think anyone in this room would have clicked on, right? Who knows, who you're all aware that you, who you're super fun with, who knows that have made money in the last year in their super? I'm not talking about your contributions. There's a few hands. Like, <laughs> that doesn't have a self made super fund, by the way. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? So, in, in, a, in a normal super fund, like, if you've got 100 grand in your super, and you've added five grand this year, is 105, is it worth 110 because it's gone up? And that's where you've come to, like, shit. Like, like, I mean, it gives me more money into it over the last 30 years than it Yeah, like, crazy, crazy, insane. crazy. It's like Wolf Wall Street, eh? That's your, that's your super fun, no? <laughs> not Jimmy Choo or whatever it was on there. That's your, yeah. Um, so, cool. Um, and what would be your advice or thoughts for other people that might feel like they're stuck or they can relate or do your information to them? Um, well, I, um, I guess by the stories, I had a business coach once and at my business, and he, um, he came in and I was going to help me do all this stuff. And I said to him um, after a few weeks, I said, mate, tell me about um, the businesses that you ran. And how did you go and how did you build your business because I was really big and build my business? And he said to me, I've never run a business. I'm like, what? <laughs> and, and he's like, I've never run a business. Uh, yeah. I, I can't really tell you. And I said, well, how can you be a business coach? And I think that's the analogy here that everyone that seems to work in this company is big property and loves property. Yeah. And they've got investment properties that walk in the you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's the difference. Yeah, I don't think it's anywhere else like that. Like I've seen, I've used other five changes. Yeah. It's nothing like this place. Yeah. Right, when I first started the business, it was people were like, what, you've got a buyer's agent? It was like, so team with the buyer's agent 14. Who remembers a buyer's agent 14 years ago? There's no such thing, right? There's no industry. And now, yeah, it's, I look at all the buyer's agents. Like, they don't even own anything. They, they do courses on how to be a buyer's agent and passive income, and so it's crazy. That's the advice out there. So, cool. so I would say that you want to go for it and, and maximize as much as you can. Right? Just, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's not a dress for us to Just try to take ownership of your future and. and all about ourselves. Yeah. All about ourselves. That's the biggest part, yeah. Cool. Wayne, well, have you got anything to add? Question. Um, well, yeah, you know, just the, the struggle that you had with the finance can probably elaborate. So it took a few, what, four months than normal. Yeah. yeah. Because he was self employed and getting everything across the line. So yeah, it takes a lot of persistence uh, patience. and patience. Um, it's too easy for people to just go oh, it's all too hard and like it feels so easy everyone will be doing it but it's like it's easy and it's like being disciplined too and it's like okay you just then push on a little bit extra to get that it's not getting up yeah yeah and it's always another angle another way yeah exactly well do you have any, any any comments questions thoughts highlights of getting that finance or um, it was really good to see um, Jason coming in with us, although it took a few months um, longer than we thought at the table to get him more properties than we thought we could and really his equity and expand his portfolio. And even now we're planning to get more properties under his assessment set and expand his uh, property portfolio, which is good to see. Yeah, awesome, awesome. The, the, the whole team in the office have little bells on their desk, so that whenever, whenever we have a win, the bell goes off, and it's constantly every day, either the IR team or um, uh, Flanzinger team, yeah. and it's great, and you know, it's a good team effort that we, we have here, and you know, we don't see ourselves as separate companies, yeah. um, we're, we're there to work well for you guys, um, yeah, it takes time, uh, some faster than others, but yeah. it's definitely worth it. 
Uh, I think that the, the, also with, um, with Jason's position, I remember a couple of times I popped on the phone, I remember walking along the beach in front of my house at, uh, at, on the coast, and I walk along the beach chatting to you, and like, what about if we drop this one? What about if we do this? How do we stack it up? We, we just need to make the bank happy, right? So do we pull equity and buy something cash? Do we, you know, how do we structure it for the bank to get them to give us the most amount of funding? I think that was, that's probably like 80% of the other properties, right? I found the properties are great, but did their thing. And it's like, how does that fit into the finance strategy? You know, it's us collaborating. And so I remember going to the channel, like, what about if we delete this one and swap it with two of these ones? And, you know, and, and that's what we had to do to, to get it there. So, yeah, it was in between the kids screaming and you go, hang on a sec, I've just got to feed this baby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get back on the phone. Yeah. yeah it's so, yeah, a lot of people don't know the babies, but yeah, it's a lot of them don't So, <laughs> no, it's all right, that's all right, I'll share it, it's fine. They're getting old enough anyway, so they're all fine that way. So, um, with the, um, yeah, it was like, it was chats, so like, it's like, how do we make it happen? It's like, oh, I'm going to go to the bathtub now, so, yeah. <laughs> Cool. Sorry? You had to go to the bathroom and the kids asked me. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I actually did a Facebook Live once in the bath. I did. About three years ago. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah. It's pretty fun. Um, but I, I guess that's, that's probably the other advantage of yeah. dealing with Hayes in that you just, you know, there's buyers agents. Um, but you don't get that much experience as you got to do yeah. with someone like that. Yeah. And um, you're paying a fee, which is probably the same as everyone else, but you, you get all this mentoring, all this experience. It's so much more, it's so much value. And yeah. it's priceless, actually. Yeah. So um, I really appreciate it. Um, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. appreciate the feedback. Humbled. And, um, that's the thing with finance, right? Rose didn't say it before, I'll say it. With finance, like, when you call a broker normally, they're like, oh, yes, you can get it. No, you can't get it. If that's no, that's the end of the story. No more discussion about it. But if something goes wrong, like, I walk into the team and they're talking, oh, I've got this situation, let's talk about that. Like, someone in the team is like, how many staff are written Zinger? Like, total is like 14 or 13 and 12. Okay, cool. We've got some more starting to so. Go for us to ring up the other day to expand the team. But um, with, um, with that, like, there's 12 different sets of eyes and, and minds that are going over your files. So someone will just you know, go, hey, what about a little bit from this perspective? What about we take it with that bank? And um, the collaboration is very important. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate that. Congratulations. Did you want any final words, Nathan? Oh, I've been sitting up here for hours. <laughs> Look, uh, I don't really have anything really exciting to say. Like, I think that the team have said a lot of really good stuff. We've been blessed with hearing lots of different experience uh, tonight. Um, and I think that there's a lot of collective knowledge in this, in this room, like people that have got their own stories and their own dreams. And what I'd really like to see it's like today you hear you might mingle with someone over the bloody food up the back or whatever, and then you go to a Christmas party or another function and you talk with someone's like, hey, I've got four more properties. I'm like, wow, I was trying to get my next one. And then like it's, it's just collaborate and talk to each other as well. Um, that's why we have the community of, of everyone here. Um, but yeah, the, the team has been great, so thanks a lot for all of you coming and spending your Friday night. Uh, thanks a lot for traveling. Um, I had someone here in the room, I can't see him at the moment. He's traveled from New Zealand to Melbourne to, um, yeah, uh, to, to be here today. And um, yeah, a lot of you have come from different locations, so thanks a lot for turning up. Uh, thanks to the team for making us look good and all in our branding and our marketing, and everyone's given us raving comments there about our marketing and our branding. Um, I remember a lot of these times. I'll be doing a presentation, and on my way here at the end, my car with my little laptop going, oh, I'll turn the steering wheel, let's get the presentation ready, and it's a very good breeze. So uh, thank you very much for the whole team for making this night very, very good. Thanks for hosting, my appreciate that. And uh, thank you for the whole team for doing what you do. I have one question. Yeah. Um, what's next for you? I'll try to what's, what, what's your goal? Okay. I was going to say, I'm going to say,
And it's not really my business. It's too hard to cut it off. I'm quite losing weight and I'll cut that off. But um, for me, um, I'm just refining my portfolio at the moment, actually. So um, I'm in an interesting phase. Like last year, I've got my dream home. Um, but, you know, I've, I've got lots of things going on. I've got lots of renos that I'm doing, like the mountains, and I've got some that got hit by cyclones in far north Queensland, renovating lots of things. Um, so you get all my renos done, get those cash flows pulled back up, like missing two mil here, a mil here, like it all adds up. Um, once I get that, then I'm just going to plan on, like, if we look at this, um, actually one of my mates the other week just going for a walk at the gym, and he said to me, if you had your time over again, would you change buying all these acreages in the Hills District, right? And I was like, I would have been better off if I had just bought all the cheap shitters that I was buying to start off with, right? Because that hurt me for cash flow. But I think about it, and that's helped me get to the next stage of my portfolio. And each stage, we have options to push ourselves forward, and you've got to look at what you've got. And I'm looking at these motels that I use to buy my like, foundation portfolio. Those things, if they bring in like one of them, the blue mountains, let's say it brings in two million a year, just to make up the numbers here. That will be like, I could buy a property every month. I could buy a house in Blackwater every month. I could buy you know, a little cheap in Perth once a month, so, or twice a month. So I'm just getting that cash flow and funneling it back into my foundation. And I have actually a goal of building another 100 foundation properties in my portfolio to take it to the next level. So it's using what I've got to now to then divert back into those foundation properties. So that's where I made the money and stuff. Well, and I think we'll all, all agree it's definitely an inspiration to us all. Thank you, Mike. Um, and it's definitely replicated uh, with the crowd that we have tonight. Yeah. And uh, I know some of you are only just starting out, uh, and some have been you know, in the game for quite a while and have quite nice portfolios. Uh, but uh, these sort of events are great to network and mingle and ask the questions when you can. Uh, we hope to do it every year. Yeah. Uh, moving forward, and I uh, hope to see you all at the Christmas party come late November time. November. There you go. Fantastic. So, thank you once again for, for coming along. Appreciate you taking the time out of your Friday evening. Uh, the pokies are downstairs. If you want to lose all that cash, if you lose too much and you're feeling sorry for yourself afterwards. Hop on your email, message blink and say, put my rents up. And look out for some presented emails at three in the morning. Yeah, a lot of you guys have had some emails from me though. Before we came here, I was on my email, I was like, yeah, I'll pop out these things. So it's like there's some bills there waiting for you. So. Perfect. Well thanks very much again. Thank Congratulations everyone.